Welcome to America's Day of the Races. Good to have you with us on our Fox Sports 2 coverage for the Sunday card from Aqueduct and from Hot Springs, Arkansas at Oaklawn Park. It's brought to you in part by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit America's Best Racing dot net today sun shining both here in south ozone park new york and in hot springs we'll check in live there in a little bit greg wolf sarah el Badwi, jonathan kitchen here on the desk at uh, the big a as we get set for a feature today named after one of certainly the most fan favorite new york breads of all time four-time new york bread champion gander 15-time winner we unfortunately lost back in 2022 he was a special horse to watch and this year's edition of the gander three-year-olds going a one-turn mile there's a few ways you can go in here it's pandagate who's the morning line favorite for christoph clement but doc sullivan sarah coming off back-to-back -back wins I've been impressed by this horse so far. He's gradually improved with each start, earning a higher buyer speed figure in each subsequent race of his and really stretching out to the mild distance in that last start. I thought it was a really big move up for him, a very professional effort where he was able to finish well ahead of a decent horse himself in Brick Ambush. Well, I, I thought Doc Sullivan was impressive in the last start. Um, and, and of the two kind of forward types, Doc Sullivan and the big torpedo down on the inside. I definitely prefer Doc Sullivan also because of the draw. Being drawn outside of that other speed type, I think, goes a long way. But I think both of those horses are going to have to answer uh, Pandagate's question as that as they turn for home. This is a horse that I thought was closing extremely well last time into a slow pace, one of my favorite angles. That's the 8 to 5 morning line favorite for Christophe Clement. He'll be making his three-year-old debut feature race for us, the eighth in that gander. Post time, 426 Eastern time. Let's take a look at all the races we have coming up on the program presented by Claiborne Farm. Race six here in New York. It's coming up in about 20 minutes or so. Kicks off the late pick four. Fast here in New York, fast in Hot Springs. So races six through nine coming up, including that gander and out at Oakland. We'll bring you races four through 10 on the card, including Ain't Life Grand, who scratched out of the stake yesterday, going to run in this spot. First start back for him off a lengthy layoff and trying to find maybe a little bit easier spot. There's still some pretty tough competition he's going to deal with uh, in that comeback race for him. Let's go live to Hot Springs right now. Check in with Paula Duca and Maggie Wolfendale. Maggie, how's the shoulder? <laughs> Barely a mark, Greg. I was surprised when I, uh, I took, put the pajamas on last night that he really didn't get me. He was just playing anyway, just steal. But, Polly, another beautiful day weather-wise here. But yesterday was electric for Rebel Day. Really was. Almost 40,000 people here uh, to watch Justin Timberlake, or no, sorry, Timberlake, <laughs> get the job done in the Rebel. And I thought it was, you know, it held up to form. He was a horse that was well uh I guess Buzz going into the Breeders' Cup. He already had a grade one win in the Champagne, so he was the class of the field. Um, and I thought he did it, you know, with not a great trip. He did it just in style. I thought Common Defense ran a good second place finish, as you can see, a pumped up Christian Torres. As he should be. Uh, Christian Torres really knocking on the door in trying to break into the upper echelon of jockeys and possibly, we'll see how it works out, but could he have secured a derby mount? But what I liked most about Timberlake's effort yesterday was that we didn't see any of that rankness that we saw going back to the hopeful. He had a better trip in the Champagne, but he also got rank in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. He settled beautifully between horses, and when Christian tipped him out, he delivered. Uh, Brad Cox citing that, you know, it was a building race. He was pleased with the effort, but that he'll benefit greatly from it from a fitness perspective. That's scary. Yeah. Because, you know, Brad's the type of trainer, like, he's now, I think, starting to get that derby fever. Listen, he, we already know his accolades, but the one thing that's missing is that Kentucky Derby. I think he's now starting to take different routes. Angel of Empire, third. Uh, I think he knows what he has in the tank with Timberlake, and he might be a tough foe in the first Saturday of May. Yeah, and he earned 50 Kentucky Derby points to getting into the starting gate and talking with Elliot Walden of Windstar Farm yesterday, citing that the Arkansas Derby or the Bluegrass could be the next possible start for Timberlake. But, Polly, it's beautiful as far as the temperature. Quite windy here. Yes. We do have a serious headwind for the horses um, as they enter the stretch, but horses are on the track for this fourth race. As we take a look at it here um, for these claimers, I think Steve Asmussen well represented here, Paul, as he will send out an entry in this one, including Beaver Hat, the 1A, and Wartime Hero, who you were saying 
arguably has the best numbers of any of these. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of the money is going. When you look at wartime here, the last two races are very good races. Now, Steve claimed this horse off Cipriano Contreras. He's going to raise his source for 16000 which I think is actually a plus as we mm -hmm. get to the post parade here. Yeah, and wartime hero. I've noticed last time that he did wear an extension blinker today. First off the claim, Steve opting to just put short cup cheater blinkers as we'll check out the 1A in here as well. That is Beaver Hat, second off the claim. Yeah, second off the claim. The two goes through Devil's Vision. You know, McLean Robinson's horse has been running of late. A Minnesota bred in here that has some back numbers to go to. Minnesota, number <laughs> three, wind crash. First off the claim here for Ike Green. Not always easy to claim off Carl Brobro. No, it's not. Um, and this horse was in for 10 last time. I'm kind of with you. Colosi goes through for Joe Petalino. Game winner last time with Ramsey Zimmerman back aboard again today. Yeah, stepping up to the 20 as number five get back Goldie. Dan Ward picks this one up and immediately gelds him. Can he run on the dirt? That's a good question, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things where Sometimes that kind of works here at big prices. Here comes a six in here. Cozy, my boy, another horse here. This one for Carl Broberg. Needs to break out of the gate a little bit, but did get up in time last time out. He's going to hope that Chapel Barn provides some speed. Make the rider Carlos Barboza here. Yeah, Carlos should be on the send. Mystery Mo will go through. I think a player in here for Greg Compton. His barn's been heating up a little bit. Uh, this horse, yeah, this horse needs to save some ground. A lot of second place finishes on the resume, though. So Cyclone will be uh, stretching back out in distance. Yeah, you know, I thought this horse, you know, I, I took a look at Cyclone. I'm thinking, okay, maybe this horse is live. And then I looked 0 for 9 at Oakland. Really tough Ooh. for me to get over that with no exacta finishes as well. Paul, I do want to get back to the other part of the uh, Asmussen entry. Second off the claim with Beaver Addy. He's a horse I saw up in Saratoga. And I think he looks way better than what he did going back to that effort. Granted, it was back in July, but his top line stronger. His coat is resplendent considering we're in the middle of winter here and he has been training in Kentucky. Um, I, well, here, I should say, at Oaklawn. Um, but last time, I thought he was kind of rank with Keith aboard. Uh, kind of made the early move, ha had little to sustain that late in the game, running with his mouth open uh, throughout that race. And the Asmussen team's gone to the full Monty as far as their equipment's concerned. Uh, figure eight, tongue tie, ring bit. So hopefully that provides Keith a little bit more leverage with this guy this time around. Yeah, so when you look at this race, the straight one has the numbers, but coming off the layoff, yep. where I think you're right, the 1A is the horse with the upside, uh, now second time in Steve's barn. A lot of people will, you know, Steve's the winningest trainer in, in North America, but if you ever look second time in his barn or second time out with a lot of his young horses, he's the more, even more dangerous. So I do think the 1A, I, I, I do think that the 1 and the 1A could run 1-2 here. Um, in this race, especially if the Compton horse on the outside of the eight does not get that kind of trip. Do you like the eight? Too many second place finishes. Yeah. I just think maybe the one or the one A, one of them is going to run one of their races in here. You know, you're getting three to two on an entry. And sometimes, you know, an entry that is logical to run maybe one, two in here, you might get a good place price in here too. I thought the three was a little interesting yeah, I'm with here. You. Uh, coming in, I, yeah, like I said, tough to claim off of Broberg. And I know um, he, well, he was five to one last time. He had to break from the outside post. He went wide um, going into that first turn. He did get over in the backside. He lost a little bit of position. I thought he tried really hard. Uh, he has, you know, consistent type of numbers here. I thought he was a little bit interesting. But like I said, I'm a little bit leery when horses go, leave the Broberg barn. Yeah, I know. I get what you're going. Um, you, Carl is such a good conditioner, but this horse has some good numbers to go to. A lot of second place finishes. I can see this horse sweeping up some money. Now, Harry Hernandez just runs second on a six to one shot in the last race. You're getting your your price in here, Mags. How about seven the rail? To one, I guess? Yeah, seven to one. And how about ten to one on the rail runner, Devil Vision, who's the drop down in here, two back. He met a field that was far superior than anything he's meeting here. I think he's the most dangerous horse in here. I do, really honestly do. I. I you got to go back, and I get it. He's a, it was a different horse in 2022. If he can find any of that, it's just because when you look at the entry, they look tough. When I look at Devil Vision, maybe the drop can help this horse out. And knowing that McLean's horses have been firing a little bit of late, Eduardo Gallardo and the Irons, I, I think a 10 to 1, that's your, your play in here, maybe for a price or to maybe to link up with the 1 and the 1A. Well, yeah, Greg, uh, it looks like the Asmussen duo is going to be tough to beat in here, but maybe we can sneak in some prices and 
We've seen our fair share of price horses here at the meet. Yeah, we have. I'll see how it plays out. Thanks, you too. I mean, you, you look at this entry, Sarah, both halves of the entry, the little more consistent, at least right now, is, is Wartime Hero. But these bottom level claiming races, surprises can happen. Just look at Beaver Hat um, and who beat him last time, 66 to one shot that day, Colosi, who's 28 to one today, the four horse. And Colosi seems to be that type of horse that can pop up with one big priced win per Oaklawn Mead as he had done last year. But when you're looking for consistency among this type of racehorse, it's sometimes hard to find, and that's probably why a lot of betters are gravitating towards a horse like Wartime Hero. If you were trying to beat this entry, though, Jonathan, where would you go? I mean, I, I think my eyes initially went to the six, Cozy My Boy, but I just don't abs I don't trust this horse, right? Because I think this horse is a little bit overbet because of the trouble last time. You know, when a horse kind of overcomes that trouble, people get a little excited because everyone can watch replays now. Well, you think you can watch on Naira Betts. But the problem is, is there's a fast pace in front of that troubled closing trip. So while, yes, there was trouble, to me it cancels each other out because there was a setup involved to make that look a little bit better than it actually was. I think the entry is going to be extremely tough to beat. Mystery Mo as they load up. That's that eight horse, three to one, dropping down from 30. The last couple of starts for the Greg Compton barn. See if his barn can get going a little bit. Ramon Vasquez will ride. Matt Dinnerman with the call. Here's the fourth from Oakland. Here's Colosi, Mystery Mo, two back, get back Goldie, and to the outside, Cyclone. Here's Cyclone and Rocco Bowen. We're ready to go. And uh, Leroff, a hop in the air at the start for Devil Vision, spots the field a few lengths. Windcracker gets a tap on the shoulder to get into it. He's got a narrow lead in the early stages. Chapel Barn in second and third wartime hero easing off the speed. Stable made Beaver Hat is next and a little bit of a tight spot there. Just brushed the rail. Cozy, my boy, is outside of him. A gap of another three to Mystery Mo. Get back Goldie is next, racing alongside Colosi. Two and a half more to Devil Vision and the trailer is Cyclone clone as they make their way up the back stretch about 20 lengths from first to last a strung out group and chapel barn is the pacemaker now chapel barn passing windcracker who delegates the track on the tail of that leader second he's three ahead of wartime hero and cozy my boy then beaver hat racing alone he's five from the front runner a gap of six more back to mystery mo and colosi devil vision third last already being scrubbed upon get back goldie second to last cyclone the gray has yet to pass a runner as they are very strung out into the far turn, they run. Chapel Barn in front, a length and a half. Windcracker trying to come on now, is sent along from the second spot, is gaining ground on the front runner. Wartime Hero, he's patiently ridden, has run, you can tell. He's down at the rail. Third, now getting off the fence. Cozy My Boy, shake it up. Beaver Hat is next as they hit the quarter pole. Chapel Barn, still ahead leader. Windcracker in an all-out drive right up alongside. Wartime Hero gets the green light to move forward if he's good enough. He's gotten the right setup. It's Chapel Barn drifting out. Windcracker had to steady. On the outside, Wartime Hero still third, plodding along. There's a 16 to go. Chapel Barn kicking on to a two length lead. Wartime Hero coming after him late. Chapel Barn still in front. Chapel Barn needs the line. He's going to get it. Chapel Barn over Mystery Mo, who rallied on for second. Wartime Hero third. And Cozy My Boy was fourth. Big upset here, Polly, to kick off our program here in race number four, 17 to one on Chapel Barn. He looked like the speed on paper. Carlos Barboza taking full advantage of that, and he takes him gate to wire. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, this is a late jock change. So Carlos Barboza uh -huh. won this race with the same weight, right? You cannot get in with uh, a lighter weight, right? So I, I think this horse, yeah, I mean, he won with the 118 pounds and took this horse gate to wire. This kid is a talented rider, phased um, everybody off, and the eight came rolling oh. on the rail here. I think this snatched second away, yeah. and he did from the entry here, who just ran third. So if anybody was bridge jumping with the entry, they just got home. Yeah, entry going off at four to five. A wartime hero looks as though he settled for third, seven, eight, one, six, unofficially winning trainer. Can you help me out? Alitiero Altamirano. 
You freaking nailed that. Well Thanks. <laughs> All right, Taz, he is the owner and trainer of the son of More Than Ready, seven-year-old Chapel Bard, gonna get his picture taken today and certainly reward his backers, Greg. 17 to one, did come out a little bit in the stretch, interfered potentially with that three wind cracker, but that horse weakened in the stretch. So we'll wait and see if, if anything comes of that as we get back here to New York, race six. New York Preds made in special way to kick off the late pick four at six and a half furlongs. And it's Bob John Ray, first time starter for the Chad Brown Barn, son of Good Magic, current favorite on the board. To downstairs, Richard Migliori. Yeah, guys, I think this is a really interesting uh, New York bred maiden race, and I, I'm just going to talk about first time starters, starting with the one Barron's Bounce, homebred for Barry Schwartz's Stonewall Farm. Just an attractive son of Flatter. Um, you know, he's well, he got a tough post, post one, needs to get out of there running, but he looks fit, looks well conditioned, and he's certainly acting very classy. He's just a horse that looks like he has a lot of uh, intelligence, smarts about him. The five horse slowed down. Big Andy, Bruce Savine, very capable with first time starters. Like the way the son of Lao Ban looks. Bruce said, last couple works, he kind of started figuring it out. He still thinks he might be a bit green, but his last couple works were his best works. The six, uh, Bob John Ray, he, he's a standout physically. Uh, you, this is a horse that just checks all the boxes. He was training down at Payson Park. He's still got his Florida tan on. He looks very well prepared uh, for his debut. And the nine horse, uh, Landauer, Gary Siaka, D.T. Stables and uh, Patrick Lewis, uh, Steve Bick, D.T. Stables, and uh, at the races with Steve Bick on the radio, he is here, drove down with his wife Tina, and nice to see him here. This is a horse I think will look, be much better for a race, but I always like when you see the connections with a homebred show up in the paddock. One of the best barns in the game with a first timer getting plenty of attention. That's the current favorite for this man right here, Chad Brown, Bob John Ray, making the debut, son of the two-year-old champ, Good Magic. We'll have the post parade and tell you who might beat him when we come back as we get set for the start of the pick four at Aqueduct. Back with you on our FS2 coverage, America's Day at the Races, brought to you in part where you can play it all. Go to nowrevets.com, get signed up started. Match 200, that code to use for new members that sign up to get this offer right here, that $200 deposit match, new customer bonus. There it is again, match 200, again at nowrevets.com. Pick four starts here, coming up, New York Reds, made in special weight, six and a half furlong sprint. 
and a few first time starters in this field. We start with one of them from the inside for Linda Rice. There's pedigree on the female side of the family, but it's mostly for a route of ground. So I wonder if he'll want to go further down the line. One of the more experienced runners in the race for Mark Hennig, sorority prank. Yeah, last two starts on wet race tracks. Interested to see how this horse runs on a dry, on a, a dry track. A little bit of winterly pedigree with the three Alpha Cat. And sold for a very modest amount, only $3,700. But Jorge Abreu, he's got good stats. Second start, new gelding for mortgage rate. Yes, yeah, source that took no money on debut and also did not break very well. Lots of win early pedigree with slow down Big Andy. Yeah, this first time starter has quite a bit of precocity throughout his pedigree. Here's the Chad Brown first time starter, Bob John Ray. You got to Google Bob John Ray Mechanicville and you'll see why Chad named his horse this. If you want a new car, he's the guy to talk to, by the <laughs> way. Short time, 11 to 1. This is a horse that was benefited by the racetrack last time. Heavyweight champs, really good debut, and then what happened second time out? Yeah, the debut, a ton of speed. She comes back, shows speed again. Maybe it was the uh, the muddy racetrack. Gary Siaka, first time with a nine. This is a horse that has some sneaky good workouts back a couple uh, of mornings ago, so definitely one to watch out for. And a second time starter on the outside. The dam did produce a six-time winner and minor stakes winner. Yeah, this horse did not break first time out. Uh, got beat by 16 links, but it wasn't as bad as I think it could have been. So that's the field. Minute to post in the sixth starts this pick four. Nine to five favorite. That eight horse on your screen. Heavyweight champs. Let's go back to the debut. It was in Stakes Company in the New York Stallion Series. Set the pace. Week into third behind Antonio Venice. This is a horse that had been working well coming into this race. And I thought, even though he's put up for second officially in terms of the disqualification of Brick Ambush, this was a game effort from him to try to fight off some horses that had the experience edge on him. But last time, I was a little bit disappointed by his non-effort. Yeah, and look, I think in those situations, you try to ask yourself, why did it happen? And you have to try to give yourself a legitimate reason to look back to that original start. And for me, I think you could possibly lean on the Muddy Racetrack. Also comes in off of a little bit of a short break, December 16th until February 3rd. Maybe it was a, a combination of those things. Maybe it was a seven furlongs. I think if you, if you want to take a chance here with the eight, uh, there's probably some reasons. The problem is, is that they're eight to five. So, it, you know, it's not really worth it, in my opinion, to kind of hope that one of those things is true for eight to five. I'm with you on that. Yeah, it was seven to two morning line, getting a lot of attention in here. It should be the one in front. We don't know what we're going to get from these first-time starters, but potentially – one of these firsters has some speed and, and can pressure because those who have run, they don't look like they're going to be the ones pressuring. No, they don't. I mean, a horse that I like a little bit in Sorority Prank, he can be a little bit more forward than he was last time. I think he was really wide against a day where you wanted to be more towards the inside on the racetrack. And he's shown that he can run a little bit better than he did in that last out effort. But I know, Jonathan, you're interested in one of the first timers. Yeah, I'm going to take a look to the one down on the inside. I just thought it was an interesting price at 12 to 1. I understand the six looks the the part out there but uh i thought the one baron's bounce was interesting a couple of quick works uh back uh prior and and then you know there's the kind of those maintenance three furlong works to me signifies fitness right if you know the horse is fit you can work three furlongs that last work before the race if you're trying to play catch up is when you start working a little bit longer so we know at least that uh, the one's fit lot of money on that speedster right there the eight for Rudy Rodriguez, Kendra Carmouche will try and take advantage and take it to this field early on this third time starter, heavyweight champ. Start of the pick four coming up. Let's go to Chris Griffin for the call. Acting up there. That was sorority prank. Now is more settled, but rider is off. Slow down, Big Andy. Trevor McCarthy getting back aboard.
Still working with the five. Slow down, Big Andy. Is now in. Elfgar. Elfgar moves forward and in. All set. And they're off. Heavyweight champs breaks right out to the front. Also with early speed is Elfgar is going to go right with this leader, but it's heavyweight champs who's clearly the leader. To the outside is Elfgar. Down towards the inside here comes Sorority Prank is now alone in third. Traveling at the rail and moving forward, there comes Mortgage Rate, who's now going to track in the fourth spot. To the outside of that one comes Slow Down Big Andy. Very strong outfield here. Short time, then comes Baron's Bounce. To the outside of that one is Alpha Cat. Looks like maybe being eased there is just at the back of the field. Landauer just got passed by Bob. John Ray is the trailer. They work into the far turn, and the battle continues up front. It's Elfgar who takes it right to heavyweight champs, and these two boxing on. Elfgar at 34 to 1 is taking it right to the favorite. Who's got more? The favorite heavyweight champs now puts a neck, now a half length back in front. Elfgar, they are six lengths clear here from an all in sorority prank. The rest with some running to do. Heavyweight champs at the top of the stretch has shrugged off the challenge so far from Elfgar. And heavyweight champs is just sprinting away. Heavyweight champs is opening up three, four lengths now here as they approach a final furlong. Elfgar is a clear second. It is far, far back to the rest as they approach the 16th pole. It's all heavyweight champs. Heavyweight champs is going to win this one easily. Heavyweight champs wins it over Elfgar. From the outside, here's Bob John Ray up late for third, and then a three-way photo for fourth. Then woman at 20, second flat. Heavyweight champs delivers a knockout blow to this field. I mean, that was dominant from the start. Grab command early by the front end under Kendrick Carmouche, and that was it. Were you kind of surprised that no one really showed that much speed out of the first time starters outside of this huge long shot in Alfgar? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's this is the way that uh, dirt racing was meant to be won, right? You pop, you go to the front. You know, I, I guess when you look at heavyweight champs past performances and you look at that debut uh, and then you look at the past effort, all of those kind of maybes that I had mentioned prior were all true. The problem is, is that it's a tricky proposition at eight to five. Even when they win like this, I, I still don't know if it was the best wager long term to be playing eight to five shots with all of those things that you're hoping are going to change. I think that's also because you're hoping that one of the other alternatives would have run a bit better than maybe they actually ended up doing because of the horses with experience. He was absolutely the one to be. At that debut race we talked about, but it was a head scratcher what happened second time out. Maybe it was that muddy track. It just didn't like it all. I certainly like things today. Eight to five favorite, including the competition he faced. 34 to one behind him. Tried to duel him early and then was no match in the stretch. Bob John Ray for Chad Brown third. And then Barron's bounce for Linda Rice. First timer checks in and fourth. But it was no doubt about it who was the best in here. Eight to five favorite with the win. Kendrick Carmouche all smiles after the victory to kick off this late big four prices when we come back. Derby trail, pick it back up. Here at Aqueduct and Bergen for Brad Cox, the Jimmy Winkfield winner, will stretch back out to a mile. We'll have a preview coming up. the adrenaline pumping suspense filled action of the sport of kings no matter where you are with naira bets it's fast easy and secure download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions thrilling handicapping contests and a one-of-a-kind vip rewards program don't just watch horse racing be a part of the action with naira bets What a spectacular return for Charlatan, who will romp in the run-happy Malibu Stakes by four and a half emphatic lengths. Charlatan, ultra impressive. It's a new day for a new king.
back with you on our FS2 coverage. America's Day at the Races, brought to you in part by legendary Claiborne Farm. 100 years of doing the usual, unusually well. Heavyweight champs, gate to wire score. Third time the charm here and gets back to that talent we showed in that debut. This was impressive. I mean, he really took command of this race early on from the start and was able to see that out, even facing a little bit of a pace pressure challenge early on in this race, shrugged that off, no problem. And, and really nobody ran on much from the back. So Gates of Wire win, heavyweight champs. Card today, Jonathan, there's been, there's been quite a few surprises. Um, this obviously not one of them. <laughs> a race I thought was gonna be a lot more wide open where some of these firsters look like they might have something offered, but just not the case. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of times you, you you forget, you get excited about the pedigrees, you get excited about the connections, you get excited about uh, what these first-time starters could do. But, man, experience goes a long way when they kind of know their job. They can pop away from there and do it in a professional way like heavyweight champs just did. As we talk about going to break, uh, back on the Derby Trail with the Gotham coming up in New York one mile next Saturday. Purse of $300,000. Look at the probables that are eyeing this race and – Talked about Bergen going a break for Brad Cox. He has done very little wrong in the first three starts of his career. Three-year-old comeback, impressive too. It was a muddy sealed track, but he took a big jump forward speed figure wise. He's been impressive. I mean, you really can't fault anything he's done so far. And he was cutting back a little bit in distance too. So that may have been a question, but he was able to answer it very convincingly. And, and Iridescent, the horse that he's beating, we saw this horse come back earlier today, finish a narrowly defeated second. So you know that he's running away from a horse with some solid form. Yeah, I mean, th there's always going to be the questions, right? It, it, does this horse want to stretch out? But the son of uh, Liam's map, I, I doesn't see any reason why they won't. If you look at the Jimmy Wink Winkfield win, uh, this horse ran fast early, was involved. The pace was real in there. And to me, when horses are involved in paces that are real in sprint races and then are asked to stretch out, to me, it says that there is going to be some energy in the tank if they can find a way to not have to run so fast early. And then also the one-turn mile race at Churchill Downs where the source was second, I thought ran well enough as well. So I don't really worry about that question. And, and you're in the right hands with uh, future Hall of Famer and Brad Cox. Yeah, mile race too, without the best trip that afternoon. And that was just the second start of his career. It never hurts to show some ability at Churchill Downs with him being a three-year-old. So we'll see what happens with Bergen in next Saturday's Gotham as we sort of cut back in distance. Don't see it a lot at a lot of these racetracks on that road to the Derby, but that's what we do with the Gotham. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that's one of those races in terms of where it's placed on the calendar. We saw a really full field for this race last year, and it seems like we might get that yet again this year, which is always exciting, makes it a better betting race. Things, you look at that schedule too, uh, Fountain of Youth, San Felipe, Tampa Bay Derby, JK is just starting to amp up these 50 point races. And before you know, we're gonna have those 100 point races here. And we're gonna know a lot more about who's gonna be the horse to beat going into that first Saturday in May. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer of the 50 point races. You're trying to gather information, right? You don't wanna to get too involved with anything because you really don't know until you get to the 100 point races, which most of those are at a mile and an eighth. Um, the Louisiana Derby, obviously a mile and, and three sixteenths, but those are when the real answers uh, the questions are answered, in my opinion. It's just these are the fun preps to kind of keep this the momentum going for the first Saturday in May. Going to be fun. We're going to take a timeout. Uh, what a surprise on the road to the Oaks. And what a day for D. Wayne Lucas. And how about the pilot aboard as well? First ever graded stakes win for young Keith Asmussen. For D. Wayne with Levin Muffin in the honeybee. We'll be back.
Back at America's Day of the Races on our FS2 coverage. Thanks for spending part of your Sunday afternoon with us as we get set for more from Oaklawn coming up. $30,000 maiden claiming six furlong sprint here in race number five. And it's Miss Escapade, one of the more experienced runners in the group for Team Asmus and Steve and son Keith teaming up with the Speedster. Let's go out live to Hot Springs and Paul and Maggie. And Greg and Polly, I think it's all about can you trust Miss Escapade because she was a bit disappointing in that last effort. Did was involved in a quick pace, yeah. but what do we get from her today? I don't know. You know, she's drawn inside posts in a lot of her efforts, and I'm wondering. Last time out, she's kind of one of those horses when you push the button, she's going to go. Now, mm -hmm. from the complete outside. Does Keith decide whether to really send from the beginning? Because she kind of ran off on him in a little bit, and then she just kind of stopped towards the end. It's going to be very interesting where he tries to sit her, if he tries to rate her or not. I will say with this headwind into the lane, it feels like speed horses yeah. might be at a little bit of an advantage. We saw number one, JJ's Joy, first time starter, taking money. Here's number two, Dixie Rag on the turn back. Yeah, this is a horse that's claimed for uh, Johnny Cordoboy for Kenny Jansen. Here. I also thought the three and Rocco Bowen going by. If you throw out the two muddy races, the horse got some numbers to go through as a long shot. Yeah, makes her a player is number four, Red Volta. I don't know if she's a player. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, getting legs with yeah. Chelsea Bailey aboard. Uh, first time starter for Rudolph Brissett. Uh, has a little more turf pedigree, and looking at her, Paul, I thought that she looked more turf. You would think a uh, first time starter would get money in here. Here's right. another one, the six, getting a tiny bit. Now the seven, our queen, I think this is the toughest horse to read in the race. Yeah, she does make a positive uh, jock change, though, as she was a little tough to handle in the lane last time as number eight. Wowzers does have a, have a win early pedigree as a first-time starter. We've seen a couple of small purchase prices win, $4,000 purchase. The nine goes through. Carlos Barbosa looking for back-to-back -back races. I thought the horse looked okay. Yeah. 53-1 to one last time out. You're getting nine to one or eight to one today. I thought she ran sneaky well in that race. It looks sharp today for her second effort. Here's number 10, Ida Lou. I thought she made sense. Yeah, Lindsay Schultz had a winner yesterday on the card. And there's your favorite, Miss Escabade. You were saying you think she might run better today? I, just because of that, we've seen speed do well yeah. today. So we'll see, though. Outside post, she can kind of play her cards as number 12, another firster. Catalina Sunrise just went through your screen, too. Yeah, the jockey change there. Uh, well, today the cruise off always mounts yep. today. Uh, Joey Belmere will get aboard. This is a Philly by Catalina. Cruiser will debut with Lasix. Holly, let's get back to number one in here. You were mentioning to me that this Arkansas bred daughter of El Deal taking money early on uh, down from, you know, morning line, who knows, in these, you know, wide open maiden claimers. She is nine to one, which based upon connections, you would think that the five would be the shortest of the debuters, yes. and she is, but there's not much difference between the two. No, I'm with you. If you're looking for a first time starting here, I'm 100% with you, Maggie. The one is the livest one, especially on the tote board. It's taken money since the beginning. At one time, was six to one. Now I know she's going to float up a little bit more. And you're right. When you looked at the racing form, Rudy Brissett is a very good trainer. He's 23%. So you would think in this race that his horse would take some money, but she's really not. Do you remember the sire, El Deal, when he was running? He was fast. He was real fast. Yeah, I know. And this family on the bottom side, they're not, you know, superstars, but they've been very productive, like horses that have had long careers and multiple wins. So a hardy type of family. I didn't, she didn't wow me, but she does look as though she could be quick as she does come in here with three consecutive gate drills. To her outside, number two, Dixie Rag. Just looking at her, I, I, I thought she would benefit from the turn back and distance as she is sharp here first off the claim. Yeah, you know, out of two barns, been claimed out of the Robertino Diodoro barn. A lot of people will stay away from horses like that, but, you know, she's been pretty consistent, and you're getting your price at 19-1. to 1. And that's the one thing about Oakland. You can't be scared at double-digit horses because they <laughs> come in here. Yes, 100%. <laughs> we saw when we got here, we landed here on Friday, and they hung up a 61-1 to 1 shot and a 71-1 to 1 shot in back-to-back -back races. So you can't be afraid to take a little bit of a, a swing, especially in these lower-level claimers. I'm a little intrigued and in taking a swing with number eight in here at 15 to 1 wowzers love the name uh but a daughter of outwork who hits at 19 percent with his debuters that are three-year-olds and upward the dam was a uh, graded stakes place on the synthetic stakes place on the turf a half sibling one first time out a quick type of horse um and there were two other siblings that uh won on debut as well 
you know, I like the work pattern with the horse because if you look, the horse has a bullet drill on December 17th. Then they went slow. This horse worked 158 at 159, but look at the work two back out of the gate. Seems like she woke up in 48 and two. I, I'm not arguing with anybody that likes a first time starter in here. And at 16 to one, you are getting Louis Cube aboard, who's a very good uh, train. I mean, uh, jockey. So, yeah. I, I not arguing with that pick. I, I like the 10 just because yeah. I know Lindsay's very good. And this horse is dropping. Uh, you know, a lot of these horses have already been at this level. I'll land on the 10 in here. But you're right. We'll see how the racetrack really does play if the 11 is able to clear this field. Because, you know, this horse really did hit the brakes when he got, you know, towards the lane last time. We'll see what happens today. I, yeah, I, I agree with you with Ida Lou. I think she's the most logical and at least looking at them physically, the best looking alternative to your favorite. And here as we saw the one acting up as they make their way back to the gate. Greg, uh, Miss Escapade, maybe the conditions today will help her finally break her maiden. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because it looks like, I mean, hands down, she is the quickest in this field. But what does Keith Asmus do in this spot drawn outside? Well, he's made a lot of really good decisions so far this meet. So I would imagine that he's going to try to use some of that early speed, try to get some good position a little bit more towards the inside, save some ground in this race. And that would likely be the key to her success. If somebody wants to look elsewhere, I totally get it. She's just been more consistent than some of the others at this level. Anyone else catch your eye in here? I'm going to take a shot with this inside horse, the one JJ's Joy. There's a bunch of siblings that had a bunch of speed. A lot of times, if you just can just pop away from there from the inside, hold that position, uh, it could be a little mm -hmm. bit sneaky. And the connections with not a lot of it numbers. Three for 26 with first-time starters. It's not a lot. That's 12%. It's only 26 first-time starters, but, hey, you know, 12% is not a bad number. Big price on the three, too, who was third behind Miss Escapade, and that was off the bench. Best races for her have been on a fast track. She gets back to fast going today after a couple of wet track performances. Rocco Bowen rides. Let's go to Matt Dinnerman for the call. Here's the fifth from Oakland. And Catalina Sunrise. Catalina Sunrise coming up to the outside. We're ready to go. And uh, we're off. Going to the front is Miss Escapade and JJ's Joy. JJ's Joy strides in front, a length and a half clear of Rita's Revenge, Red Volta, and Miss Escapade. No pay, no hay. In the fifth position, Blue Jacket, Gray Cap, running five off the pace. Another two to Ida Lou. Four more back to Art Queen. She's alongside of Maisha. They're two better than Catalina Sunrise. Opposite the crowd, Dixie Rag to the inside, and Wowzers is well, well behind. Detached from the field as they hit the four turn run. Here comes the favorite Miss Escapade to challenge JJ. JJ's Joy on the front end, and these two get acquainted with three furlongs to go. A big space of four or five to Rita's Revenge, dropping back in the wrong direction. Ida Lou's about to pass her. Red Volta not going to get it done. Passed by Maisha. No pay, no hay trying to move with her as they come to the top of the lane. JJ's Joy loses the lead to Miss Escapade. Ida Lou continues to charge on the outside. Looks like a two-horse race at this point between Miss Escapade and Ida Lou. Ida Lou and Chris Landero with a head lead. Miss Escapade, Keith Asmussen left behind in second, Maisha third, and then Art Queen. But it's Ida Lou coming to the line. Ida Lou drawing away under the right-handed encouragement to win it by two. Look at Wowzers from a very far back position. Just got up for second. A big run down the lane for second. Maisha was third, and then Art Queen. All right, that was pretty exciting, Polly. Look, the 10 had it virtually wrapped up, which she won. Well done you with Ida Lou uh, for Lindsay Schultz here. But where is the eight? I'm looking like, oh, right now, and she's with, not on the picture. Where I'm is she? I was joking with myself. I was like, what, Maggie? You're an idiot for suggesting the eight. And then all of a sudden, she just appears out of nowhere. What? Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. my gosh. That well, was, I mean, appropriately named. I mean, <laughs> wowzers. wowzers. The 10, like, won this race. Look easy and if you have 10 9 on the screen you got to be oh my god and the eight just comes out of nowhere great call by you maggie a four thousand dollar filly by outwork wow she galloped out by the field by yeah. about 20 lengths but idaloo just sat a very good trip yeah. and that's why they were betting the one the one had been showing speed early in the morning and it kind of ended the day 
for the 11, Miss Escapade. Exactly, Miss Escapade, I, I think she's a bet against pretty much every time she runs here. Uh, she looked to have things sewn up, but Ida Lou just sitting in the perfect position. Chris Linderos with the win here. As we said, Lindsay Schultz feels like her barn is heading yes. in the right direction as of late. 100%. I mean, Lindsay's just so sharp. And this was one of the horses that was dropping for 30. A lot of yeah. these horses had already been kind of at this level. And some of the first time starters were the other horses. And the 10-8 got home. I think we can go home now, right? Uh, I'm, I'm done. OK. Let's go get some cheeseburgers. I'm good with that. All right, cool. <laughs> Greg? <laughs> Don't leave let yet, you two. We, we still need you. <laughs> Idle Lou the win, and that eight. Um, her name perfectly described her finish in the stretch. Yeah, I mean, for all of those that love the gallop out angle, this is your wow. horse for Sirs. next time. That horse ran on <laughs> so well to end up finishing second in here. But your winner, I mean, she had faced some decent horses in her first couple of starts. And so getting that class relief and that pace set up, both of them really helped. Back in New York. So here is... Dr. Blute, 14 months away for Chad Brown, former winner of the Empire Classic. Let's head downstairs to Mig for more. Guys, this is a really good group here. I like this you know, honest, hard-knocking horses that show up, and this group embodies that. We'll start with the three, Trafalgar, just making a really nice impression here. It's a horse that... You know, I'm always trying to match up what I see physically to what I like on paper. I think this horse makes a lot of sense on paper and could not look any better from a physical perspective. You know, Linda's a trainer that, you know, clips her horses during the winter so their coats are, you know, tighter and shinier, but he just is really exuding overall good health. The five horse uh, divine armor, another one making a really nice impression. He's stretching back out to the mile distance. And, you know, it's interesting. When you see David Jacobson's horses this well turned out, they tend to run to their looks. And th this horse is really kind of checking the boxes for me. And the nine horse, Dr. Boot, coming off that extended layoff, looks outstanding. You know, listen, he comes from a barn that they're usually very good off the layoffs. This is an extended layoff. His coat could not be any better. And he just has the look of a horse that's very well prepared off the extended layoff. They usually are from this barn, uh, moving to Chad Brown's barn. But, you know, how much did Chad Brown know about this horse? Was with a different barn. Now he's with Chad Brown, so 14 months away. And when he last lined up, he was in the Safi Joseph Jr. barn. He was, and we're taking a look at his last win. And I thought this was an impressive effort in the Empire Classic because maybe a mile and an eighth is a little bit further than he truly wants to go. But he was able to handle this distance with that front running score. And he has very good early speed when he's on top of his game. And I know that in his last start in the Alex M. Rob, he was a part of a pace that was not really where he wanted to be because he fell back pretty significantly in there. But he was off for so long that I don't want to hold that against him too much as he comes back now for the new barn. Manny Franco, JK, going to be aboard. Fact that he's fresh, too. You expect to see him fire out of there? Yeah, I'd like to think he's going to run pretty well, take, considering the money he's taking. Um, you know, it's never a bad thing moving into the barn of a, of a future Hall of Famer. Uh, and look, he's drawn towards the outside. But I think the question is, 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 is fitness, right? Is he, is he is he going to be ready to be able to be challenged in this race early? Curbstone just went by a horse who has been typically going uh, a lot better going longer. The two bourbon calling, 701. Yeah, I'm not crazy about horses off of Rob Atras. Kendrick Carmouche taking Trafalgar on the big warm-up. He's a horse that has the numbers, but he seems to need a pace set up. Lord Captain went by. We'll get back to him. Here's Divine Armor. This is a horse that ran on the toboggan last time out, but it's been a little while since he's hit the board. Big price and some changes with Montauk Point. Yeah, some of the best races were on turf. There is a dirt race back there, but that was for Shug McGahee. Alternate reality it was a winner two back for 40. And he faced a good field last time. Can he compete with this level of horse, though? 14 months away and now debuting for the Chad Brown Barn. Here's Dr. Blute. Wonder if he's going to show the same speed that he used to have. If so, could be dangerous. And here is Champion Stream, former grade three Nashua winner. Now with Rick Dutrow. Well, I'll tell you what, even more so than that, that debut in Saratoga back in 2022, Champion's Dream won a real horse, looked like he was a real race, looked like he was going to be a, a real horse and just kind of has tailed off throughout his career. Interesting to see if uh, Rick Dutrow can kind of get him back on track. 13-1 with Jose Gomez from that outside post as we're three minutes away here from the seventh. So here's Curbstone, breaks his maiden at a derby distance of a mile and a quarter. Biggest number he ever ran. He ran lights out when he went a mile and an eighth. And now coming off the bench, he has a race since July. He's going to come back at a mile. I kind of 
of wonder if he's one of those types of horses that gets really good around this time of year. He had a really similar break to this in the past where he went away through the fall, through the early part of the winter, came back and did pretty well for himself in December of last year. So I wonder now, and he's had that extended time off, he's coming back at a distance he may not be best at, but he might be a horse that really relishes this time of year. I've got no problem with the individual, the horse himself. He runs well. He's got nice figures. The problem is, is that he's got a little bit of a habit at times of not breaking particularly well. Didn't break well last time. And the deeper you go in the past performances, you can find some other races where he hasn't broke well. A so good skate race when he was two to five. Right. So you're yeah. always just a little bit nervous that is that going to happen now? Nine to one on Curbstone here. A long time away in a distance he's never tried before. Let's go to Mig. Yeah, guys, and, and that is a bit of a problem. Sometimes he doesn't break as sharply. I, believe it or not, when I was riding horses that, you know, had a habit of maybe not being handy their first step or two, I didn't mind having post one. It gave me a lot of room inside of me to work with. I wasn't in between two horses, and horses like water tend to flow to empty space where I'd get pinched. At least if you get away a step slow, you have that room to work with. You can kind of get a horse up into the bit, get them into stride. I think Curbstone looks outstanding, but he's also a horse that does carry a lot of weight, and I do think he'll be better for a race. He is a horse that does his best running when he's forward, when he's involved, and there's not a tremendous amount of speed in here, but I do do think the race will help him immensely. My top selection is going to be the tri the three Trafalgar. I just don't know how much help he's going to get up on the front end as far as pace goes. He looks outstanding. I think he's in good form. Kendrick Carmouche is riding tremendously well. Um, he's really tightened up the jockey's race with Dylan Davis, really cut into his margin. This could get to be a fun jockey race as we go forward. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to pick Trafalgar. Dr. Blute, the nine, he looks like he's the controlling speed here. And Chad Brown usually has his horses fit off of uh, layoffs. I just wonder, you know, a horse that is a speed type coming off the layoff is usually more difficult than a horse that, you know, settles and makes more of a run. They tend to have to run the race, more of the race or all of the race, if you will. I'm just curious to get both of uh, you, Jonathan and Sarah's takes on the pace here. It does like, look like Dr. Blute controls, doesn't it? I mean, I hope so. I think that this is a horse that does his best running when he's forward, and especially coming off that little bit of a break. I don't really see him having any other position than being in front early on if he's going to be successful. Yeah, the tricky part is not that Chad's going to take that speed away from him, but that's not necessarily like the way Chad trains his horses in the morning. So there's a chance that through this trainer change there might be an adjustment to style i mean i i think that they would be a, a likely would be a mistake and i would think that manny will send away from there but it's not a foregone conclusion we'll see what champion stream does on the outside that horse has been close sprinting before to some pretty hot paces but yeah mile distance horse that's going to be forward you got to run pretty hard most of the race and there he is we'll see if he's up to the task here off the long time away it's the nine horse dr blute for chad brown with manny franco Let's go to Chris Griffin for the call. Champion's dream. Goes in. All set. And they're off. Step slow for Trafalgar. Speed to the outside from Dr. Blute. Right out towards the front. Champion's dream is right with that leader as well. Those two outside markers now clear off. Just in behind them is going to be Lord Captain is now going to be a challenge third with at the rail. Here's Curbstone is progressing as they get set to come out of the chute. Montauk Point is in that second grouping as well with Divine Armor and joining them up on the far outside. That's alternate reality. It's the gray up on the far outside Champion's Dream who's got the lead, but Dr. Blue comes right back to the inside and now puts a head back in front. The two trailers are Trafalgar and Bourbon Calling. 23 and 4 for the opening quarter mile. Dr. Blute to 2 to 1's got the lead. Tight hold here on Champion's Dream wants to go. It's the big gray up on the outside. They're still 1 2, and they are three lengths clear from a big group in behind them. That's Lord Captain down towards the inside. Has got some momentum at the rail. Moving to the outside of that one's alternate reality. Losing some ground was Montauk Point. Moving to the inside of that rival comes Divine Armor is looking for a seam, and here comes Divine Armor in the red cap. 
from the back curbstone. Trafalgar starts a rally from the back, and Bourbon Calling is the trailer. Still duking it out up front, head and head, 47 and 4 for that half mile time. Champions Dream and Dr. Blute, they throw it down. Divine Armor is moving to the inside here of Alternate Reality as a challenge third and is coming after the leaders quickly as they reach the top of the stretch. Champions Dream to the outside. Dr. Blute battles on Divine Armor. Curbstone's launching a rally. Alternate Reality is still in the mix as well. It's Champions Dream who's in front. Divine Armor is trying to shrug off the challenge from alternate reality. Curbstone is rolling on the grandstand side. It's still Champions Dreamer for how long? Divine Armor is now gathering that rival. Curbstone in the late stages. Divine Armor, Curbstone up in time. Curbstone got it right at the line. Divine Armor, Champions Dream in a photo. And one minute 40 and four. Uh, it was the other layoff horse, Curbstone, who's never tried this distance off since July at Saratoga last summer, uh, uh, who gets the win here at seven to one for the fifth win of his career. I guess he can get the mile distance no problem when he's got a little pace to chase, right? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, it, it, at some point throughout the race, you kept looking back to the back to see who was coming because they did hook up and look each other in the eye a lot of the way around there. Um, and it just so happened to be Curbstone. Like I said, I, I had no problem with the horse. It's just whether or not is he going to kind of have that habit pop up. We're not breaking great, but in this situation, it didn't matter. They ran so fast in front of him. He just had to show up and do his thing. And I think really in defeat, Champions Dream ran extremely well to put away Dr. Blute after that pace battle between the two of them. Still hold on for third. Divine Armor got that split to try to rally on, but Curbstone really had the best of it out in the center of the racetrack, unencumbered to make that late run. One, five, ten, seven, Curbstone. Better known for winning at longer distances, including a mile and a quarter win when he broke his maiden. Gets the win at a mile here off the bench. Put together some, I mean, that win he had back in March of last year made you think this horse could be in potentially in stakes company pretty soon off that effort. Maybe he's got big things ahead of him here in 2024. It's possible. I mean, I'm sure they'll try to find a decent spot for him going forward because he had that talent already. And I feel like this might come back as a fast race. Prices for you when we come back. We'll have the feature to come, the gander. And we'll look back to yesterday and an upset in that Haynesfield Whittington Park. And a big day for Kendra Carmouche. Puts together back-to-back -to -back wins, this time at Stakes Company. Stay with us. time grade one winner with six consecutive triple digit buyers including a 114 to win the breeders cup dirt mile he's already taking the lead as a sire with grade one winners basin wicked whisper colonel liam and juju's map plus multiple six-figure yearling sales and two-year-old sales up to 1.2 million dollars proven on the track proven in the sales ring liam's map only at lane's end Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race. from every track, every track, on every screen, every, screen. Every, day. every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month.
Back with you on America's Day of the Races on FS2 in the seventh, Curb Stone. The victory at seven to one off the bench. First time, mile distance. And beats a decent group of horses here for a starting point for his five-year-old campaign. This was impressive. I mean, he was far back in this race early, and I know that the pace really did materialize on the front end with both Dr. Blute and Champion's Dream going at each other, but he really ran on. Yeah, you gotta love that. Like you mentioned, Wolfie off of the long break, come in, hadn't run since July, and that first race back to have this performance, you know you have something to build on now, and can even take possibly another step forward off of this effort. Uh, the Morley Barn has to be excited about Curbstone's year. Here he comes. Runs down both the five and the 10 here. That was a big effort from Champion Stream here, but in defeat, Divine Armor Champion Stream, alternate reality, second, third, and fourth curbstone, $17.60. The upsets continue as we close out this week. Coming up next, feature race on our Sunday card. Named after the multiple New York Red champion, the great Gander, won over $1.8 million in his career. Mike Gatsis, who owned him with Gatsis Thoroughbred, said he was just a lunchbox horse. He showed up every single time he ran in his 60 career starts. As you take a look at the current odds in here, and of course, the man who rode him to victory in the Empire Classic back in 2002, uh, works for us. Mig, what do you remember most about Gander? Uh, just how honest he was and calling him a lunch pail horse is, is accurate in the respect that he just showed up. He went to work. He gave you an effort every single time. He preferred to run outside of horses. I had to kind of make an early move with him uh, in that Empire Classic to get him into the clear. And he made a long extended run and he had enough left to hold off the closers. But he was honest. He was game. I like my horses the way I like my people, honest and hardworking. And he embodied all of that. And uh, it was just a privilege to, to ride him. Uh, you know, I always was appreciative of the guests for letting me ride him. And uh, John Terranova, his wife, Tanya, they did such a good job with so many years having this horse prepared to run his A race. And uh, horse, that was a pleasure to be around. What a horse. Horse of the Year, champion older horse among New York breds. 15 wins, yeah, including that big one in the Empire Classic. Great at stakes winner uh, on the resume as well. And we got the race named in his honor coming up. Going to look back to yesterday, though, as we talked about going to break. Upset in that Haynes Field from Saturday and Whittington Park stepping up and surprising at 12 to 1, Sarah. This was a big effort. I mean, you kind of had the feeling that going in, there were two horses in this race that were your likeliest winners. Dr. Ardito, Baker's Candy, Maker's Candy Ease seems to be okay. Dr. Ardito running on to hit the board, but Añejo really looked like he was going to seal this race on the comeback. We hadn't seen him in a while, but he really opened up. Woodington Park just came and ran him down, Jonathan. No, he did, and Anejo probably, eh, I guess you could argue, might have moved a little bit early, but I'm not sure it would have really mattered. I think it's just the way that it unfolded. Whittington Park kind of had him measured uh, in the stretch there. It was an outstanding performance, a homebred for 10 strike racing. Uh, they had critical value, looms boldly. Another couple of New York breads that have been, uh, been productive out of that mare, so uh, nothing wrong with Whittington Park getting it done for Kendrick Carmouche. Yeah, what about to the figure here? He gets a 99 buyer for this one. He'd run some big races in the past. Not quite at this level, though. Yeah, that, that's a fast number. I mean, that's that's a real number. That's a show up in the right grade one open race and could yeah. possibly pull it off type of number. Sixth win of his career. And as a five-year-old now, looks like maybe blossoming for trainer Jeremiah Engelhardt, as you mentioned, 10 strike and Kendrick Carmouche. Took a dead heat in the last, but wound up winning at least part of the last three races on the card. Yeah, I mean, he's just had such an impressive winter meet so far. And it's really rides like that where he's getting those horses in the game, in the position to be successful and always persevering with those rides, not giving up, not thinking that he had lost that one, able to keep on going and run down a horse that looked like he had blown this thing wide open. It's going to happen in our Sunday stake coming up in the Gander. Christophe Clement, a horse who'd been facing open company the last time he was seen. Not sure about this scandal. What was Pandagate all about? We'll find out how he does in his three-year-old debut for Clement. Coming up, stay with us.
Welcome back, and thanks for joining us here on America's Day at the Races on Fox Sports 2. We are holding it down here at Oaklawn Park. That is Maggie Wolf Nail and Paula Duca with you trackside as we do see horses on the track for today's sixth race, maiden 12-5. Claimer going the mile and a 16th for uh, the Colts and Geldings in here, Polly, in a full field. It could be a doozy yet again, <laughs> as like we saw in the yeah. last race. But let's kick things off. As you were talking to me uh, prior to the horses coming out, there's a lot of stretch outs in here, and one of them is number one, Nacho Chrome. Yeah, nine out of the 12 horses here. Last race was a sprint race, so this could be a scramble here. There is the one. Taking a little money here for the Tom Van Berg run. Barn. I thought looked spectacular. Uh, best in the field, at least physically, is number two, Boots and Bourbon, stretching out second out. Yeah, for Jinx Fires and Joey Belmere, horse that didn't do much running at 50 to 1 first time out. Chris Linderos will be looking for back to back wins. He picks up our heavenly gift. Yeah, for Tammy Hornsby, who's having a pretty solid meet, and this horse is getting a little bit of action here at 11 to 1. Number four is an Archie bread. That is outlaw, outlaw run. Yeah, for Robert Klein, hasn't really shown much. He really needs, or he really needs to pick up his feet. Blinkers on for the stretch out and drop down with Golden Diversion. Yeah, you know, horse that ran okay first time out has digressed a couple times. Now drops to the 12-5. You would think today would be his best day. Yeah, hopefully he can wake up a little bit for Ernie Witt as number six, Hard Luck Henry. Yeah, Hard Luck Henry's dropping in class. The seven capital cause goes through will get Lasix. Uh, you know, and a horse that's dropping for a good trainer in Ken Kenny Von Hamel. I thought comes out of the best race, too, is number eight, Bubby Boy, and we haven't seen him in a while. Well, he debuted long. Tom Swearington's a guy that really doesn't debut long. He usually takes his time, so maybe he's a player. Greg Compton will stretch out Preacher's Kid here in his third start. Yeah, I think he's the barometer in here, the horse to beat. Greg's very good on the stretch out. He's had two horses so far this meet. They both won. He's your 5-2 to two favorite. Long shot Devil Shadow went by. Here's another long shot in number 11, Native Moonshine. Yeah, blinkers go on. Native Moonshine is one of the three horses that did run a route race. And then this horse, Maggie, I guess, you know, I can understand seven to two because this horse made up ground going long and you have all these other horses stretching out, you know, is this going to be the horse? You don't love the 12 draw, but I would think that Lindsay Hebert is just going to sit back and make one run at all these horses and hopefully they all back up. And he is coming in off the shortest time away from the races. Yeah. Last seen him on February 11th in here. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the horse who is favorite, as you were mentioning, number nine, Preacher's Kid, Arkansas bred, a son of um, ordained in here. I, I just thought second best last time mm -hmm. th behind third watch and was complimented when Sir Peel came back and broke his maiden with a 48 buyer. Yeah, this is one of these weird conditions. If you look at it, it's if you're an Arkansas bred, you're a $20,000 claimer, but if you're not an Arkansas bred, you're in for 12 5 Yeah, thanks and for that we, clarification. I'm like, there's so many Arkansas breds. Yeah, right. Wait a minute. <laughs> We've <laughs> seen a lot of the Arkansas breds win these races, too. So, you know, I, I do think the nine, you know, Greg Compton, like I said, he's had two horses so far this year that have stretched out. They both have won. He's 22% on this move. And this horse has run two solid races, uh, at least of all the other horses. Other horses have been a little bit spotty. Number one, Nacho Chrome, he'll go from the far outside post to the inside post. I thought last time they just kind of shoved him in the gate and sprung the latch, and he was just unprepared. So uh, he spotted the field a couple lengths, and the race was uh, dominated forwardly. Looking at him, gosh, he looks a lot like his sire, California Chrome, but he looks like a horse that should benefit from the stretch out. Little concern, he is quite hot and, and quite sharp. Sometimes that doesn't translate well to trying to get more distance because they've expended too much money. Oh, too much money, too much energy. energy yeah. But uh, he did look great. And if he can build upon those efforts, maybe he could be a player. Yeah, you know, he was tall, right? A tall and lanky kind of yep. horse. Mm -hmm. And he does look like he wants to get the distance to ground. I'm kind of with you. Maybe the drop of class will help in here. Um, there's just, when you look at this field, you can make a case for a lot of different horses because, like we said, like one of these nine horses is going to stretch out and like it. And maybe not because you know you of the other three horses that have already run the mile distance one's coming off almost a year layoff the other one hasn't run in november and then we have the 12. exactly um uh, his you're right 12 saturday starter comes in here with the best figure as well big galloping type of horse uh so we'll see can he build upon that effort second start here for andres uh cambray and then see, the issue you have here is 40 to one last time out. Now you're gonna take this horse at five to one from the 12 hole and gonna to have to launch past almost all these horses. So 
you know, it's a really tricky race to read. That's why I went with the horse with a nine, because I thought tactically yeah. can maybe stay closer. But then again, I don't know if she's going to be or if he's going to really like the distance or not. We all don't know. And you're one is continuing to get played here, Maggie. Is. Yeah, I was interested definitely in the one, as I mentioned. But number seven, I think, is worth a look. As you were mentioning, Kelly Von Hemmel um, and Donnie Von Hemmel uh, training this one. Gets a little bit of a makeover off since November at Churchill. Didn't do much running that day, but gets Lasix, gets uh, a short cup cheater blinker on. But that race produced four next time out mm -hmm. winners. So I'm wondering if that's kind of the livest race that we see anybody coming in here off of. Yeah, and you get Carlos Barbosa, the hot uh, bug boy who's been winning Lasix. So yeah, you're right. The kitchen sink's getting thrown at the seven here. Might improve too at nine to one. When does he go? I need Richie here. I think he goes to five pounds at 40 right at 40. 35 I 35 think. wins I think. that's right yeah. all right got to be getting close to that sometime yeah it's soon. getting close yeah well they are loading in to the gate nine to five on number nine preacher's kid will he handle the stretch out here for greg compton nick juarez in the irons see if we'll see another price though this is a wide open maiden affair mile and a 16th as we get it up to matt dinnerman for the call of race number six Three back. Golden Diversion. Two more behind the gate. Hard Luck Henry and Saturday's starter. Hard Luck Henry's it. Here's Saturday's starter and Lindsay A. Bear. Looks like they're straightening out Boots and Bourbon in the gate. Boots and Bourbon straightening out, indeed. They're also straightening out Hard Luck Henry in the gate. Now it's Saturday's starter. We're ready to go. And uh, Laruff. A very awkward break. Devil's Shadow had to take up sharply. Is well out of it early. Our Heavenly Gift steps on the gas. Goes to the front. Golden Diversion. Preacher's Kid side by side. Second. Nacho Chrome fourth on the inside. Charging into the turn. Hard Luck Henry is next with Capital Cause. A deeper Bubby Boy. And even farther out is Native Moonshine around the turn. Outlaw Run getting shuffled back on the fence. Getting that kick back in his face. He's about seven behind with Saturday's starter. Boots and Bourbon second at last. And slow starting Devil's Shadow can see them all as they approach the backstretch run. Our Heavenly Gifts got company from Native Moonshine, who's pretty aggressive here, moves past runners to claim second and press the issue on the lead. Golden Diversion between horses third. Nacho Chrome inside of them. A 3D Preacher's kid is there. They're a length and a half ahead of Saturday's starter, who's kept on the outside approaching the half-mile pole. Bubby Boy already sent along. Hard Luck Henry's with him. Capital Cause losing position. He's done already into the far turn run. Outlaw run passing that rival still has 10 lengths to gain into the turn. Boots and Bourbon still has one runner beat. Devil's Shadow far out of it. Around the far turn. There goes Preacher's Kid and Nick Juarez to the front. Our Heavenly Gift under severe pressure. Second. Golden Diversion makes a three-wide blitz towards Preacher's Kid at the quarter pole. And he comes looking for the lead now. Golden Diversion at the top of the lane. Outside of Preacher's Kid. They're going at it. Our Heavenly Gift has had enough. Nacho Chrome into third. Charging on the outside. Golden Diversion Diversion in front, getting towards the rail. Nacho Chrome, the only danger to beat him. Here comes Nacho Chrome. Nacho Chrome passing Golden Diversion. And Nacho Chrome kicking away. Nacho Chrome finishing the job. And Nacho Chrome, with the ears pricked up, wins it by a little over two. Golden Diversion was second. Our Heavenly Gift, third. And fourth, Preacher's Kid just ahead of Outlaw Run. Nacho Chrome handles the stretch out and distance with a plum broke today and really Polly got a perfect trip and ride beneath Manny Esquivel. Yeah, Emmanuel Esquivel gave this horse a tremendous ride. Great call by you. It's Maggie Wolfendale's world, or excuse me, Maggie Morley's world, and we're just living in it. Either one. Tom part. Morley gets one home at seven to one. She gets a first time starter. And she gets another one here with Nacho Crow. Well done, Max. Thank you, Polly. I appreciate that. As Tom Bamberg having a nice little meet for himself, gets his fourth winner of the meet, Nacho Chrome, in today's six. But guys, Gander's coming up next. It is in the Tom Morley barn with 
the big torpedo coming up here at seven to two. It looks like he may be able to control things. There is a look at him coming off that maiden win. Let's go downstairs to Mig. Uh, yeah, guys, and we're gonna pick right, uh, pick up right where we left off there with the one uh, big torpedo. This is a lot of horse. This is a horse that carries a good amount of weight. Big, solid, strong son of uh, Big Brown. And it looks to me like he gets loose on the lead here from that inside post. Uh, you know, I thought he was, uh, uh, you know, bothered, hampered in the New York uh, Stallion Series race. And then he uh, come back with a big effort when he was allowed to roll freely along on the lead. The big torpedo might have a tactical advantage, and he looks outstanding. The two, Doc Sullivan, also making a great impression. Mike Maselli does really good work. He was a tremendous rider in his own right. Uh, won the uh, Travers with holding pattern, as well as the Haskell with him. Just a terrific horseman all around. And the four, Pandagate, who uh, at last look was your favorite. He just looks like a typical Arrogate. Arrogate, uh, unfortunately, we lost him so early because he really stamps his offspring, get that length in them, uh, that kind of long scopiness to him. And this is a horse to me that looks like he's just kind of a relentless galloper. He just kind of stays and horse got steadied early last time. And for a horse like this, it's difficult because then they got to work to get back into position. You can't count on an acceleration, but you can count on their stamina. He looks really good. Went down to Payson Park and has been training bullets down there over a deeper surface uh, for trainer Christoph. Come on. Seven to five favoritism on Pandagate, Mig. Thanks, his three-year-old debut coming up. In his debut, this is it. Never easy to win, mile distance on the dirt in your debut, and he was able to do that pretty easily. This was a solid performance. I mean, he really put this field away convincingly, and there was some trouble in his last start over at Laurel. He didn't break all that sharply. He was squeezed back a little bit in there, and then sort of had to steady in traffic again. My question with him is that I didn't love that field in general, even though he did overcome some trouble, and he also just needs to get a little bit faster to compete with the big torpedo as well as Doc Sullivan. The the one thing I will say, though, is those numbers were two-year-old figures, so sometimes there can be a jump up, and, and I think that you're right. That's if to get faster, hopefully you will. Here's the horse that looks to potentially control on the front end, the big torpedo. That win last time out, it was a good step forward for him. He did have that traffic in the New York Stallion Series. Doc Sullivan, he's stretched out to a mile, and he's looking now for his third win in a row. Yeah, this is, looks like the, the kind of the pace pressure for the big torpedo could set up nicely for the four Pandicate. Brown, don't stop. He was a ways back of Doc Sullivan when they met in January. Those last two races, they weren't bad, but he just needs another step forward to really get the win in a spot like this. Eight to five favorite, three-year-old debut. Here's Pandagate. Uh, I thought he ran sneaky well last time, closing in a slow pace. It's an angle I love on the turf, but it can work on the dirt as well. Coming in from Parks, biggest price on the board here. I wonder if he really wants to go a route of ground, go that mile distance. He's only sprinted so far in several of his starts. Broke his maiden for soft, 30 maiden claiming company too. And then Liberty Central coming off a maiden win in the mud here in New York. Yeah, has four okay races. Three of those were on a sloppy racetrack. So let's go back to the horse who's vying for favoritism. And here and there he is, the two Doc Sullivan for Mike Maselli. Second start, breaks his maiden then stretches out to a mile in this race, and he looks even more impressive. I like him quite a bit. I like that he's shown that steady progression, improving a little bit with each subsequent start of his. Seems like he's had that upward trajectory gradually in his races and getting the distance last time. He took a big step forward, going from a 65 buyer speed figure to an 82 with this win over Brick Ambush, a horse that some of these have faced in the past. And I feel as though he has been a little bit more class tested perhaps than a couple of his rivals. He's the three to two favorite right now. Dylan Davis had been his regular pilot. Dylan though gonna show up on Panda Gate and Trevor McCarthy gets the mount here on Doc Sullivan. I don't love to read too much into the musical jockeys. Jonathan, do you take it as, as a negative that he's off this horse to ride Panda Gate instead? You know, it's funny. I actually, I actually call it the exact same thing, the musical jockeys. I, <laughs> look, I think that it's one of those deals that you just got to be careful. And I know Richie can probably elaborate on it because there's so many things behind the scenes. You know, I mean, Dylan could be friends with one of the owners and so he, of one horse, so he's not going to, you never know. And I think sometimes if you try to go down that path, it could lead you down the wrong And place. also, you know, for one of the most powerful barns in the game, Christophe Clement, you're not going to turn down that barn very often, even if you know you're not going to be on the horse to beat in a race coming up. Let's go down to Mig for more. 
Yeah, guys, I actually have a lot of intel about that. Uh, Dylan Davis got committed to Pandagate before they were even sure that the two, Doc Sullivan, was going to be going into the race. And once you give Christophe Clement a commitment, you want to honor your commitment because it's going to affect your uh, your business relationship with him going forward. And Dylan's been riding more and more uh, for Christophe Clement. He has his two grade one wins. Both came for Christophe. You don't want to alienate a barn for one horse. And I think these two horses are actually pretty close in ability. And full disclosure, Pandagate was a uh, Migliori bloodstock purchase. My son Joseph Migliori actually purchased this horse from the Saratoga sale in August of 22. Um, and he was able to procure the mount for his client, Trevor McCarthy, on Doc Sullivan, who will be my top selection. I think tactically he might have a little bit of an advantage on Pandagate. The big torpedo is probably going to be trying to control things from the front end, but I think Doc Sullivan just has a touch more natural speed and could put himself in the right spot. I think this is a really good competitive race between the one three and four are we and you know the board says that's who to look out for are we leaving anyone out i mean is liberty central intriguing off that maiden win to the outside you know, this is a horse that I've liked a little bit throughout his, his couple of starts so far because he's shown that he has some ability, right? I mean, he's a horse that's kind of that bad actor at the gate. He's given himself a lot to do in several of his races because he hasn't broken that sharply. He has those antics coming out of there that don't help him out. But when he did get the win last time, I thought that he was on the best part of the racetrack, saving all the ground, taking advantage of a rail that helped him win by that much of an emphatic victory. The thing about Liberty Central is there is some tactical speed there. I like the way that Liberty Central is drawn. But if the race favors a horse that is tactical and close, it, it's, it's tough for me to see that not going to either the one or the two in this spot. There's Doc Sullivan stepping in. Race named after the four-time New York bred champion, Gander, our feature on this Sunday card. Let's go upstairs to Chris Griffin for the call. Pendigate, Bali Amor. Liberty Central. Goes in. All set for the Gander. Liberty Central, a little unsettled. Liberty Central breaks well from the outside draw, so does the Big Torpedo towards the inside. And the Big Torpedo and Liberty Central, they're one, two, and switching right to the outside, Doc Sullivan. Trevor McCarthy shifts right towards the outside path, and that's Molly Amore, who's right in behind that one in fourth as they get set to hook up with the backstretch out in the center of the racetrack. At the rail, here comes Brown Don't Stop, is moving forward, and the trailer is Pendigate. On the front end, easy lead right now. The big torpedo is just loping along. Liberty Central is right here from second. Doc Sullivan wanted that outside path, got it. Is towards the far outside there, is tracking from third. Brown Don't Stop is going to take the inside path and now moves to the inside in fourth. Second to last is Pendigate and Bali Amor is the trailer. 24.42 for the opening quarter mile. They start to turn up the pressure up front. The big torpedo has a half mile left to go. Right there is Liberty Central in second. Three wide is Doc Sullivan in the red cap. Pandagate's following them is moving to the outside of Brown. Don't stop and Bally Amore starts a rally from the back as they are well into the far turn now. 48.55 for the half mile time. The big torpedo to the inside. Liberty Central though with a neck in front. Doc Sullivan three wide. Pandagate switches to the outside as well. Brown don't stop is looking for a way through. They reach the top of the stretch in the gander and it's Liberty Central who's confronted by Doc Sullivan. Pandagate has that sustained rally though and now Pandagate straightens up and Pandagate and Doc Sullivan there one two but pandagate's opening up late it's pandagate who's now up by two widening lengths and opening up the margin a uh, 16th left to go pandagate and dylan davis they're going to draw off and win the gander it's all pandagate going to be doc sullivan here second liberty central finished third in one minute 40 and three Pandagate takes that step forward in the first start of his three-year-old campaign here for christophe clement with dylan davis he ran well. I mean, he was a horse that really bided his time and was patient 
about making that move to pass horses. And, and once he did, once his pilot really wanted to get going, he responded very well. It was a great ride by Dylan just to kind of sit in there behind. I mean, you know, uh, Richie can probably talk about it more than I can. Obviously, I've never done it before. But to sit right in there in front of a wall, behind a wall of horses, to know that they're clipping along, and then you got a ton of horse, there can't be a better feeling as a jock. And I think that Dylan was feeling that. You know, he, he saw, he knew he was on a good, talented horse. He saw three horses staring each other in the eyes all the way down the backside. He waited in behind them at the turn, and then once he produced that uh, that that clear for for Pandagate, Pandagate went on with it. Two wins, three starts for the son of Arrogate, including now his three-year-old debut at seven to five. He does go off the favorite in here, four, two, six, three. One more look down the stretch. And wonder ultimately how much further he's actually gonna like to go. Well, you think with Arrogate being a sire, he might not have too many distance limitations. They do seem to really improve the more ground they get to work with. Impressive here, first time out in his three-year-old campaign, taking the Gander Panda Gate 7-5. to five. Adelphi Racing, Matacat Stables for Clement with Dylan Davis. Prices from the feature here in the Gander when we come back. Nightcap still to come and a lot more ahead from Oaklawn on our Sunday coverage here on Fox Sports 2. Experience the adrenaline-pumping, suspense-filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Bets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one-of-a-kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing. Be a part of the action with Naira Bets. Your guide to selecting a stallion for your mare. Step one, make sure he's won a big, famous race. Assistant guide charges away and takes the Dubai World Cup. Step two, he'd better be very good looking. Step three, he must have excited the support of breeders with quality mares. Mystic guide, he's unmissable. Call Darley. General admission tickets are on sale now for the Belmont Stakes Racing Festival at Saratoga, June 6th through 9th. Admission is just $10 on Thursday as well as on Sunday for this historic event. Visit belmontstakes.com slash tickets today. Racelands is the most in-depth product in horse racing with unique features found nowhere else. True odds, predictive analysis, and pace projection. Racelands, it will change the way you follow horse racing and take your game to the next level. Good having you with us on this Sunday card from Aqueduct and Oaklawn. It's brought to you in part our America's Day at the Races coverage by Naira Betts. Bet any track, anywhere, anytime. Feature in the gander goes to Panda Gate. A very happy Dylan Davis riding for the barn that, as Mig mentioned, brought him the first two grade one wins of his career. Christophe Clement. Yeah, I mean, uh, nice to have that story in more detail from Richie, able to sort of fill us in on what went on with Dylan Davis's decision to stay aboard this horse. It ended up being the right one. So Panda Gate, impressive here in his first start of his three-year-old campaign. Let's go down to Mick. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I'm here with Matt Cotter, uh, one of the owners of, of Pandagate. You had to feel really good the way he was traveling down the backstride. He just looked like his stride got so smooth. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, honestly, coming into this race off the last race, I was happy to see it was six horses because I knew, you know, with the long run in the first turn that, you know, it would be very hard for us to find trouble. And he's just such a nice, long striding horse that if, you know, if he just had free run, uh, we had a lot of faith that he was going to do what he did today. And it was, it was awesome to see. 
Matt, it looks like a, a, a lot of happy people here, a lot of happy partners. Talk a little bit about your partnership and the people that you come together to uh, have a horse like this. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a cool horse. And, and honestly, Christoph really put this group together. Uh, we bought this horse at the Saratoga sale with Joe. Uh, and, you know, he got three good groups together, you know, between uh, Maticate, Corms, uh, On the Rise, and Adelphi, which I run. And uh, it's just a lot of people that enjoy, you know, running horses and running horses here in New York. And to have a New York bred and to win a New York bred stake is always the best here. You know, with his pedigree and the way he did things, I, I mean, uh, obviously you have the New York bred races at your disposal to go to. But I'm sure at some point you got to think about open company. Uh, we'll leave that to Christoph. I, I, honestly, I think Christoph, when we won our maiden and we won by nine, the first thing Christoph said to me, like before the horse even hit the wire, was we have to be patient with this horse. And I think that was like the smartest thing he probably could have ever said. And that's why you have Christoph train a horse, right? Because he knows what he's doing and he's going to be patient and take his time with the horse. And, uh, you know, to give the horse the time over the, over the winter down in Florida, come up here and win this race. I think it sets us up for a really good campaign. The horse physically looks like he's gonna be better as a three-year-old and is bred you know, by Arrogate to be a better three-year-old. Uh, so whatever Kristoff thinks, we're gonna do. Um, but you gotta get excited about a horse like this. You know, you, you, you win a horse or win a race by nine, you know, first time out, you always are excited. But with a horse like this that looks like he's just gonna get better as you go, you're even more excited and he showed it today why. Matt, congratulations, go go accept your trophy. And guys, patience is usually rewarded in this game. Keep in mind, it's the third start of his career, first start of the year for him. So a lot of room to continue to progress and move forward for Pandagate. Plenty of blue sky ahead for him too. I mean, there's such a great program available for the New York Breds in stakes company. If open company ends up being a question they want to tackle later on, I'm sure that that could be another option for them as well. One more to come on uh, uh, what's been a difficult card to handicap for some. Um, what do you think about this favorite in this finale for Linda Rice? Yeah, I mean, I, I had the horse circled as a horse I thought could go wire to wire. You know, these, horse, these races are always kind of tricky as maiden claiming races, right? Because you have horses that have tried to run for maiden claiming and they're not getting there. You've got maiden special weights that are beating 20 lengths. It just these are, these are complicated races. And I don't think that there's any secret that we end our cards with these races often because they are, uh, they do kind of can create some chaos. Should control from that inside post can the horse handle the mile distance here drop in class from 40 down to 20 maiden claiming we'll have that coming up get to the post parade when we return and we'll talk road to the kentucky oaks that went through hot springs yesterday what a saturday afternoon for legendary d wayne lucas a maiden going two turns for the first time comes up with the goods and the great three honeybee and we'll tell you why he was so happy
Welcome back to America's Day at the races here on Fox Sports 2 as we are here in Hot Springs, Oak Long Park. And Polly, we saw a great day yesterday, but probably, probably the biggest upset and maybe the most feel good story yeah. was Lemon Muffin winning the honeybee for the coach and Keith Asmussen getting his first greatest stakes victory. Yeah, you know, and I mentioned on the show what was my favorite part of yesterday. It was, it was Keith Asmussen's <laughs> smile after this win with Lemon Muffin for the coach, D. Wayne Lucas. And, you know, you know, he's such a soft-spoken kid. I had never seen him this pumped in life. He raised that plate when he, he won for his first stakes win. And it just shows you, Mr. Lucas is never, <laughs> ever out of the race when it comes to a stakes race. And I was just so happy for Keith to get it done and to get it done for a legend. You know, his whole family has ridden for D. Wayne Lucas and to get his first stakes win for maybe the best trainer of all time, pretty crazy. And at 88 years young, he shows no signs of slowing down. Is this capped off a three win day for the Lucas Barn with Lemon Muffin? And after five straight sprint races, Wayne had said that she would benefit from getting out to two turns. And this daughter of Collected certainly responded, breaking her maiden in fashion uh, and earning points to this year's Kentucky Oaks as uh, Wayne is the winningest trainer as well in the uh, Honeybee. Could she, uh, you know, she's not a secret oath yet, yeah. but maybe she could kind of follow in her footsteps. You never know. This could be yeah. the light bulb. I, I thought Jonathan, you know, pictured it perfect yesterday when he said a lot of people use D. Wayne Lucas sometimes as a punchline because he runs his horses in spots and thinks, oh, okay, they're running them right back too quick or this and that, and you're running a maiden in the stakes race. But he likes to dance the dance. That's why he's D. Wayne Lucas, and that's why they got the job done. Keith did have to survive a jockey's objection uh, when he did kind of drift over a little bit on top of Janelli, but at the end of the day, the margin of victory told the whole story, did not affect the order of finish, and she was crowned your official winner, Lemon Muffin, in yesterday's Honeybee. Uh, Greg, it was really fun to witness this trackside, and you can, can't hope help but cheer for the coach and Keith Asmussen, who really is perfecting his craft right in front of our eyes. Just keeps doing what he's done his entire career. And, you know, to think that Keith Asmussen's grandfather rode and won for D. Wayne Lucas, and now he gets his first graded stakes win for the coach. It's a great story. It's incredible. I mean, really continuing the family legacy and to get that first graded stakes victory with a horse that was getting the first win of her career as well. Just really incredible. And I think a testament to how well he's riding throughout the meet overall. Just really has been delivering so many smart, intelligent rides and able to do the same with Lemon Muffin. And there's no standouts in this three-year-old Philly division, JK, and more testament to that yesterday. Yeah, it's 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 funny because sometimes it can be the other way around, right? Like the, there cannot be a stand up, a standout, excuse me, uh, in in the boys for the Derby. But the Oaks, there's usually like one Philly who's kind of out there running, you know, really fast numbers, like a Dreaming of Julia or Untappable or a Rachel Alexandra, and it doesn't seem to be that quite yet. Well, that was fun yesterday and a huge Saturday for D. Wayne Lucas, who's just all me long. He's he's really been going good. His horse is running even when they're not winning. Seventh race, mile and a 16th from Hot Springs and State Bread Company, allowance optional claiming group. Three to two favorite, 22 Park, who was a debut winner sprinting, won by nine lengths as the favorite. Here's Midnight Taxes. Ridden by Keith Asmussen. We'll see if he can pick up where he left off with yesterday. Speed inside, now stretching out. Going to be dangerous on the front end. Jack's spring break. Yeah, just hadn't shown much speed in the last couple of starts. Needs to find those three, four, and five back races to get away from the gate. Randy Morse having a good meet at Oakland. Sends out where's Randy. He is. This is a horse that needs to get out of the gate a little bit quicker to be effective. Two for 21 lifetime. Back gate red. Comes in off of a long layoff, hasn't run particularly well off layoffs in the past. Here's a Fleet Sky with Rocco Bowen. He ran well fresh at a level somewhat similar to this, but not so much so last time out versus Open. Jim, Ned, the ageless wonder, John Court. Single digits in the last three starts, but hasn't done much running. So just one start, it was a dominant win. It was sprinting, the stretch out now for the favorite. We'll see if he can handle a little bit more ground to work with, but that debut number, 
puts him in the mix. Christian Torres for Carl Broberg off the bench implicator. Yeah, another one coming in fresh and has not run well fresh in the past. Blinkers on Hightail Cowboy. He's second off a little bit of a layoff. Maybe he needed that last start for some fitness. Ready shoes, big number with Harry Hernandez. Yeah, if you look at that race three back, maybe you could squint your eyes and see. And stuck <laughs> in snow, used to have some speed. He used to. He did not really show it over the last two starts over a sloppy sealed surface, maybe getting back to a fast track. He can be a little bit more forward. Two minutes of post coming up. Maggie, Paul, an eight to five favorite who has just one start. Uh, it was a big win, but it was sprinting and it was on a muddy track. Yeah, Greg, it, it is a little bit of a tough price to swallow on just a second time starter jumping into the not the deep end of the pool, but jumping in against winners for the first time. But Polly, 20 to park just looks like a different class of horse, though. I'm a little dubious about the stretch off son of a spitester out of an Indian Charlie Bear. Yeah, Matt sure is a very good conditioner. I actually saw him a little bit earlier. I mean, in his win first time out was very impressive. And you you, you wonder if it's kind of aided. Uh, it's, it said a sloppy racetrack, but at that time it was kind of drying out a, a little bit, you know? Yeah. So, like, you take it with a grain of salt, and he looks tremendous on, on the racetrack. He didn't really need to get handled there at all. He was home already. <laughs> but when a horse wins like this, you know, first time out, you would think the stretch out should not be an issue. I get it. It's always a question. But when you win by open lengths like this, I know going first time against winners is tough and you got 10 other horses in here, um, but deserves to be the favorite. I do think a horse that you want to try to beat, though, at three to two. But he was also just so professional in that effort. Yeah. So, you know, he sat behind horses contently, and that does give you confidence for a horse being able to, to take the added distance. But as you mentioned, there are some other alternatives in here. Let's talk about number one, Midnight Taxes. Speaking of stretching out, well, he'll do so in his 11th career start here for Chris Hartman. And I think he's going to be on the engine. Um, we've been hearing that he's kind of the buzz horse in this race, and I think he's got to go to the front end. Keith's going to be aggressive from that inside post. Chris Hartman's always having a good meet and you know this horse had that one race off the layoff and now should be primed for a good effort I, yeah, obviously one of the players in here and looking at him physically Paul I think he looks like one that should benefit actually from the stretch out son of midnight loot out of an include mare sure why not uh, definitely makes that impression on me as number three where's Randy you mentioned to me he has trouble getting out of the gate, but yeah. sometimes that's mitigated when you add distance. They're not going to go as fast early. Kind of true. You know, I like where's Randy, but he needs to get out of the gate in this race. Randy Morris is a very, very good conditioner, and he's got a good race when he did go a mile in the 16th. He made up a ton of ground. He was favorite that race. And, you know, I think he just gave him a race now at age five, going six furlongs. He got dead left again. He was really sluggish, and then he came rolling late for fifth. He can't. It can't happen again, especially against this group. He can't leave like too much to handle or too much to do. But I think he's going to be a live horse. Manny Escobar mm -hmm. already a win on the day, but he needs to get good position if he can save ground on the rail early, especially. He's currently seven to one, but at five to one is number eight Implicator, an Arkansas bred that hasn't done much running against his fellow state breds. And when he has, he's never won against him. Paul, this is one I did not like the looks of physically. Yeah, this one for end zone athletics and Carl Broberg. Carl Broberg's the hardest guy to read in the world. Jackman, uh, who had won four races at this meet, got a W for him. Tough horse to read. I, you know, I was kind of against at five to one. I mean, I thought the horse would be a bit low over price, yeah. but now at five to one is the horse inviting. Tough, tough read on the eight. Yeah, he'll win definitely without me, without my support. I, I do think 20 to park will be tough in here. We'll see if he is as good as that blowout win first time out would indicate. Matt Shire sending him out, Francisco Arietta back on board. Flurry Racing, I think that's pretty clever, 20 to park. That's what they charge to park across the street. That is true. Yeah, well, we'll see if he can get it done <laughs> and go undefeated. Matt Denneman has your call. Fuse. Stuck in the snow to round out the field. You're stuck in the snow coming up. We're ready to go. And uh, Lyroff. 
Good start of Fleet Sky gets the first call. 20 to Park takes the second spot. Now third as Midnight Taxes moves forward from the rail and snatches the lead away from a Fleet Sky. Midnight Taxes, Keith Aspison on the lead. A Fleet Sky on the outside pressing in second. He's about two ahead of 20 to Park running in third. Jack Spring Break racing inside of him now. A three deep high tail cowboy not far off that pair. Then the gray wears Randy and stuck in the snow between horses. Another four lengths back to back gate red. Ready shoes slipping inside of him and a 3D gym net is there. They're five lengths ahead of Implicator who's the early trailer will attempt to do his best running later. They're down the back stretch. Midnight Taxes assumes control on the lead and gets a comfy time of it too. A length and three quarters ahead. A Fleet Sky running in the second spot. 20 to Park running in the third position with Hightail Cowboy. Stuck in Snow is there and the Gray Rays Randy. Those four across the track, three behind into the turn. Another three to Jack Spring Break, who's lost significant ground. Joined by Ready Shoes. Both runners have to turn it around from this point. They're five clear of Jim Ned, Implicator, and Backgate Red. They round the far turn. Midnight Taxes, just a neck in front now. The big long shot of Fleet Sky sticks his head, in fact, in front. And a Fleet Sky going on. Midnight Taxes sticking to him, though. And these two are off the turn as one. A Fleet Sky running a big one to this point. Midnight Taxes inside right there with him. Stuck in snow is third. 20 to Park is fourth with Hightail Cowboy. Furlong to go. Can a Fleet Sky pull this off at 53 to 1? Midnight Tax is trying hard, but he can't keep up with a Fleet Sky going to give Rocco Bowen his second win on the card, and they've pulled it off at a big price. A Fleet Sky won it by three and a half. Second Midnight Tax is photo for third. Stuck in snow and 20 to Park. A fleet sky giving Alan Milligan his first win of the meet. Barocco Bowen, he already had a winner on the card here, Polly, as the one hung in gamely, but at 53 to 1, a fleet sky would not be denied. Can I say Wowzers? <laughs> because Wowzers was trained by Alan Milligan, who came flying home yeah. as a first time starter. He had his horses ready to run today. 53 to 1. That's the way to get off the duck. Yes! That is in yes. dramatic and high fashion to get your first win of the meet. Certainly knocking on the door. Rocco Bowen, uh, a good ride here, sticking to the early leader. Would not let him out of his sights for this son of Northern a fleet out of the Sky Classic Mare Twinkling Sky for Tom Morrison, Alan Milligan, and Rocco Bowen, guys. Another incredible long shot. This is the biggest price of the day. We've seen some surprises early. Nothing like this, though. 53 to 1 on even looking back at it now, a hard one to figure. Didn't run like a 53 to 1 shot. I mean, really took off the pace early, made that nice move after your pace setter, who was a much shorter price. Even had a hard time pulling this horse up. This horse had a quite the run today. Back to New York. Nightcap, one turn mile, 20 maiden claiming race, and goes through this horse right here, who should be the one in front. They have to come catch this guy to win the race. Can he last the mile, the question? He actually had a pretty bad start last time out, even though he still got to the lead. Yeah, and that was a day where you didn't really want to be inside either. The rail was at dead on the 12th of January. It was the first race of the day, so it's not anyone's fault. You don't know how those biases are going to take shape until the day goes on. Eight to five here. What do you think, JK? I mean, beyond this horse, there's not a ton of form. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's a couple of horses that, that look similar in terms of speed figure. But the one thing I do know about this horse is John on the inside, you'd like to think they'll find the front end. So there's a pace advantage there. Jose Lizcano for Linda Rice just claimed this one off of Rudy Rodriguez, and now the drop down in class to 20. Here's the two, noble one. Yeah, had a little bit of a rough trip last time. Could also take a step forward. Interesting at 12 to one. Six to one, Uncle Eddie for the Gary Contessa barn. Yeah, this one just hasn't done much running with single digits in the last two starts, fifth and seventh. Crown that scene actually hit the board in the debut Saratoga last summer against Restricted Maiden Special and has gone downward since. He spent a lot of time on wet tracks, though, maybe getting back to a fast surface and routing moves him up. My man Woody was second at this level last start. You know, he's piling up to chances, but he has been improving a little bit. He ran well last time. Another Linda Rice runner. Long shot here. Brown as a biscuit. Yeah, it didn't run horrible last time, but did get a slower figure for that race. 
Nine to one, an equipment change for Rudy, 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 trained by Rudy Rodriguez. This horse was favored, part of an entry, two back, didn't get the job done that day, and then really didn't do much running last time. Rossington, player in here, four to one. Yeah, it just doesn't break that well. I'm surprised this horse is taking as much money as uh, he is. And that's your field to close things out. Three to two favorite. Heavy favorite and deservedly so because it just looks like Rockstar Boy has the ability to try and control on the front end. Let's go down to Mig. Yeah, guys, and he's taking a lot of money here, Rockstar Boy, on the drop in class, claimed for 40 last time. He certainly looks like from a physical perspective and certainly from a pedigree perspective that the miles should really suit him well. I mean, he's a big, got a lot of size and scope to him. He's by Catholic boy, you know, out, out of a union rags mare. And pedigree-wise, says he should handle the mile. No issue whatsoever. The seven horse, my man Woody, trained by Bruce Brown. Good effort at this level last time. Bruce Brown's horses always look good. They're really always well turned out. And there's no exception here with the seven, my man Woody. And the 10, Rossington, also taking a drop in class off a poor effort at Parks. Uh, He's my top selection. I think he's well posted. I think that he suits, he fits very well when he ran for a maiden 50 tag here, albeit on a muddy track. It was his best effort. His two uh, efforts at parks weren't that good. Some horses don't handle that surface very well. I think he's well drawn outside and taking the drop in class. I think he gets the run of the race from that outside post. Four to one on the 10 Rossington here, who was third on a muddy seal track at a mile. That was against a little bit tougher against Maiden 50 in the second start of his career. He ran well in there. I mean, he, that's one of his better races. And, and if he did not really appreciate the surface over at Parks, maybe he likes it here a little bit more at Aqueduct based on that race that we've seen from him. And now he gets some class relief relative to what he's faced in the past as well. I just don't love that he hasn't really shown much speed as of yet. And his main rival has. Now, and that would be this guy right here. Let's look at the start. Last time out for Rockstar Boy. Leaps up in the air, then sort of down to his knees a little bit. It was not great. Still was able to get to the front, but then weakened. And it was off a long layoff, too. Yeah, I mean, to me, you know, a lot of these races are about inter energy distribution, especially when you're talking about stretching out or going longer. You know, if you look at Rockstar Boy's effort, right, after, after stumbling, and then having to make up that ground to then make the lead, that's a lot of energy that was used in the first part of that race. So while they got a little bit tired sprinting, one might think, well, if they got a little tired sprinting on the front end, why wouldn't they get tired sprinting going longer on the front end? Well, because if they don't stumble and they don't have to go as fast in a route race as they do as in a sprint race. So to me, if Rockstar Boy can just kind of pop away from there clean, use that quickness that we just saw on display, find a good position forward, they'll be able to relax a little bit and still have some energy left when they turn for home. You got a really aggressive rider in Ruben Silvera on the nine, Rudy, 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 who, you know, no question, the one, hands down, fastest horse in the race. This horse has been forward before though, albeit in longer races, uh, even though we're going a mile today compared to what Rockstar Boy's doing. Does this horse try and pressure? I mean, maybe, maybe they think that those are the tactics that would get the job done in here. But I think they've seen that when they put this horse in a forward position, he hasn't quite been able to seal the deal going further as of yet. Now, they're making a couple of equipment changes with this horse. They're taking the cheek piece off. They're adding the blinkers, maybe to get a little bit more focus, a little more sharpness out of this horse. But he's also going to have to get a little bit faster to beat Rockstar Boy. Second off a lengthy layoff, too, for Rockstar Boy. That should help that fitness, too, being able to finish. And the drop down in class, 7-5, to five, the one to beat, and the one to catch on the front end from the rail. It's the nightcap on our Sunday card from Aqueduct. Let's go to Chris Griffin. Goes in. All set. They're off. Good speed from Uncle Eddie from right in between horses, right out towards the front. But there's Rockstar Boy. And now Rockstar Boy will assert and assumes command is now a length in front of Uncle Eddie, who's going to take back into second and crown that saint, is in third. Just behind them, my man Woody under a snug hold is in fourth as they back off the tempo and a new leader up top. 
Moving up on the outside, Crown That Saint is now taking the lead, is up by three quarters of a length. Back to second is going to be Rockstar Boy. Is just watching this leader. Is just going to kind of decide where to go. Might move towards the outside here as it's Crown That Saint who's in front. Rockstar Boy, they are five lengths clear here from Uncle Eddie, who's back there in third, is joined up on the outside by my man Woody. Then comes Noble One in the red silks. Rudy, Rudy, Rudy is towards the back end of the field. Second to last is going to be Brown as a Biscuit in the trailer is Rossington very strung out here as they went 48.52 for the half mile time and the 25 to one shot is getting away from the favorite right now is quickly put four and a half lengths on Rockstar Boy it's crowned that Saint who's in front but Rockstar Boy is back within range and coming right after this long shot now crown that Saint is about to be confronted and passed up on the outside here by Rockstar Boy who's just looming up on the outside here comes Rockstar Boy to the outside of crown that Saint hasn't pushed by yet can crown that Saint, fend off Rockstar Boy, but Rockstar Boy has now taken the lead. Rallying on from the back, my man Woody, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy is making hard work of it, Grandstand side, but it's Rockstar Boy who straightens up. Rudy, Rudy, Rudy now commences a rally. Crown that Saint's run a good race there, is alone in second. Rockstar Boy inside the final 16th. It's going to be Jose Lascano and Rockstar Boy. They win the finale. Rockstar Boy wins it, crown that Saint. Hold second, then came a tight photo. That was Uncle Eddie in the late photo with Rudy. Rudy, Rudy. And woman at 43.32 seconds. Rockstar Boy, Jose Lascano, content to let this long shot get in front of him. Patient, waited, rolled right on by as the favorite to get the win. Any anxious moments for you when he really let crown that saint take over and kind of spurred away before coming after him? I mean, it's always nerve wracking, right? If you watch enough racing, uh, you've, you've had long shots like this, 25 to one shots, turn away the seven to five shot that you loved. So my brain, unfortunately, is conditioned to get nervous about any situation. But uh, I mean, it, it felt like he, he, he kind of had his measure all the way around there. But uh, yeah, no, there were some anxious moments. One, five, four, nine, 25 to one shot, trying to steal it and take command, not to be in the end, a very easy win uh, for the favorite on the board here. Linda Rice claiming off of Rudy Rodriguez, getting the one here for Cloud9 Stable. This is just a more professional effort, I felt as well, stretching out a distance for the first time because he broke a little bit sharper. He didn't have those same gate antics where he hopped up like last time. And he was more attentive to what his rider wanted to do, sitting off of another horse and able to go pass on by. Favorite closes things out on the Sunday card here in New York. Seven to five. Again, one, five, four, nine. We're going to take a timeout when we return. We'll look back to more stakes action from Saturday out in Hot Springs. Octane showing some different tactics, sitting just off the pace for a big win in the grade three Razorback. We'll be back. Stakes. They come on for the finish. Annapolis by a head. It is Annapolis in front. It is Annapolis to win the Coolmore Turf Mile. Nominate now for this year's Phasig Tipton Selected Yearling Sales. The July Sale. A strong market for precocious and athletic yearlings that attract the sport's leading end users. Last year, 40% of yearlings sold brought $100,000 or more. The 103rd Saratoga Sale. The crown jewel of American yearling sales, Saratoga set new sale records for the second year in a row, including the highest price yearling sold in the world in 2023. Ties upstairs, $4 million even. New York Bread Yearlings, the number one marketplace for New York breads, held during the Saratoga race meet. Selected sales, superior results. Visit selectedyearlings.phasingtipton.com to nominate now and rise above the crowd at our 2024 Selected Yearling Sales. The sun shines bright on Caraconti. 
His first crops of racing age are showing brilliance on the racetrack with a high percentage of stakes winners. His versatility is evidenced by winners on all surfaces across the globe. Spanderella could not have been more impressive. The sun shines bright on this value sire. Here down 25, here down 25, here down, thank you. Right here, 525,000. Kara Conti standing at Gainesway. Back with you on America's Day at the Races on our Sunday coverage card in the books here at Aqueduct. More coming up from Oakland. Our program brought to you in part by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit americasbestracing.net today. We close things out here at South Ozone Park, New York with a favorite rock star boy, Jose Lizcano. Linda Rice first off to claim and a drop down in class for the win. And Linda Rice is just a trainer that puts her horses in a spot where they can be effective. She's always very good at finding where they can run their better races and thought that this one might need a little class relief to do so. She was right about that. $4.90 for the victory. Pick six, 3,200 plus. Well done if you put that together. Card in the books here in New York. We got more coming up, including the feature at Oaklawn. Um, one of the big races from yesterday for older horses, grade three Razorback. And take a look at the stakes winners, but Octane, been a neat horse who is a stakes winner at two, three, four, and now five. Julian Leperu aboard for the victory as we go to Pauly. Paul, usually this horse does it on the front end, showed us a new tactic yesterday. Yeah, he really did, Greg. And it seems like he's growing up and, and he's a big boy now, right, at age five. And you're right. I mean, he's been consistent at age two, three, four, and now at, at age five. And I thought it was a, an absolutely brilliant ride, too. He kind of, by Julian Lebrou, used his speed early to get in position. It looked like a race that was going to be a lot of speed in there, but he was able to put away the front runner. And, you know, this is game. You know, he had a lot of horses in here coming right at him, and he's coming off a 97 buyer, a couple 99 buyers. He's eight for 18 lifetime, and you think he's collared right here, and he's just got more left in the tank. You know, Magic Tap tried to make a late run to split horses there late. It just was too late, and kind of horse like this, like Octane, you, you almost wonder, you know, the, the perception is, okay, that was the limit. The, the limitations may be on his distance. This horse might be getting a little bit bigger and stronger, and maybe a longer distance to ground could actually make his speed even more dangerous than when he cuts back to like a mile or so. You know, Magic Tap did not disappoint. But you gotta also remember, Magic Tap ran against Saudi Crown. So this puts Octane in some decent company maybe going forward. And I think in some longer races, I think they can experience, um, you know, take a shot at some longer races because he was able to carry his speed a little bit longer. He seems like he's a kinder horse too, like you mentioned, Greg, rating from off the pace. Well, you had the success in this race yesterday. Why not stay along this path they have in Hot Springs? It's been incredible what he has really been able to show us throughout his career. And that victory yesterday was really impressive, showing that new dimension and being able to sit behind horses. And I know he had come in off a loss at a short price prior to that, but I think he really avenged himself yesterday with that nice score. And he was up close the whole way. Eighth race, JK, coming up next. We're going to see Team Asmussen. Together again here, Steve and son Keith, not taking much money from the inside. And a horse, wow, he's been seeing Mount Craig for so long, who early on in his career showed so much ability, it's just never panned out for him. Yeah, Mount Craig, you, you, you see these horses that show that talent first out, and then just, you know, sometimes it just doesn't materialize. Kenny McPeak, he's got Ben Franklin right now, the favorite. Let's go to Maggie for more. Yes, Ben Franklin looks good here as the favorite, guys. But a lot of attention, I'm sure, on number 11, Olivier, because he is the full brother to Flightline. Except, as Richie pointed out, I remember being on the show but not here. Richie looking at him saying he doesn't look anything like Flightline. And I can fully confirm that. But I do think he's a horse that's going to appreciate the added ground. He was asked for speed in that six furlong contest. He sat right behind uh, the pace early on. And and then just kind of stayed on evenly. He didn't accelerate, but he 
didn't gallop out well enough. So those types of horses, they appreciate the added ground because they don't have to be rushed off their feet. They can find their stride, get in a rhythm, and therefore kind of just grind it out on the way home. Now, Olivier, looking at him, yes, he's not as well put together as Flightline. He looks nothing like him, but I do think uh, looking at him physically, he will like the added ground. He's still one that is needing to develop a bit more, just that top line to kind of come together and get a little bit more fit. But otherwise, I think we'll see an improved effort from him. Now, number one, Pursuit of Power. They paid a lot of money for this son of Gunrunner, and I can see why. He's incredibly good looking, had the worst of it in his last start as a beaten favorite uh, over at Indiana way back when in June when he broke well, then they tried to save ground, then he got ranked. He was checked all the way back to last, and that race forwardly dominated kind of a merry-go-round affair. Comes back in here looking incredibly fit and well prepared. I think he could be a little bit better than those last two races would indicate. Number two, summon your courage. Now, I am not one to go against the judgments of Hall of Fame trainer Todd Pletcher, but whenever I saw this horse running in New York, I always said needs long. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, being a son of practical joke, but he's huge. He is really long as well, and I think that Will Walden, who I am a fan of, I think Will does a great job. Uh, he's in his you know early years as a trainer, obviously has had a lot of great mentors. Obviously, his dad, Elliot, worked a long time for Bill Mott, too. But I think this horse fits these conditions perfectly. Looks spectacular here uh, going the two-turn mile. As I do want to mention, the first-time starter, number nine, Quality West, son of Quality Row, the Dance of Stakes winner on the turf. And both of the siblings did win first time out, including Girl Daddy, who was a graded stakes winner. Despite saying that, he does look as though he might benefit from a start. Brad Cox usually has him looking very fit and defined. He just looks like that type of colt that's going to need to run into fitness. And furthermore, he's a four-year-old making his debut. There's obviously been some issues and setbacks along the way. He's a good-looking type. I'll watch him with some curiosity, but just feel as though he might need this one, Greg. This is like breaking news out of Hot Springs. Brad Coxhorse, that's not one of the favorites here in a maiden race out there. Eight to one. First time starter, $500,000 son of Quality Road. As they come out onto the track. We'll get to our post parade here in a moment. The brother to flight line, Olivier, with his outside post. Second start coming up for the Rudolph for Set Barn. Well, we'll see if the added ground really helps this horse. I mean, it seems like, obviously, the pedigree suggests that there's a world of talent for him. He's got some big shoes to fill if he's ever going to be like his older brother, Flightline. Why would he do, JK? <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was pretty good. He was pretty good. Uh, Olivier was 2-1 to one on debut. Being a full to Flightline, if you're 2-1 to one on debut, you probably can't run very well. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> Probably one to nine if he could run a little bit. Flight line, one of the great talents we've seen in this sport ever. Were you Never there that beat. Day? I was there. Yep. I was there, and a friend of mine was playing in the Breeders' Cup betting challenge. He had $80,000, and he bet it all on Flight Line. Smart move. And he won. Turned and it into over half Never an anxious dollars. moment. Never an anxious moment. What an incredible talent. And one of his most impressive races. I mean, obviously that Pacific Classic was, was that jaw-dropping performance just by the sheer margin. Classic was incredible as well, who he put away. And the Met Mile didn't break well from the inside post. It did not matter at all. That was his first time really coming to a, another racetrack, shipping outside of California and, and having to overcome adversity really every step of the way in that race. And I think when you think of Flightline, you're thinking of that Pacific Classic because of the margin of victory. But based on all the things he had to overcome, maybe the Met Miles up there too with one of the better performances from him. Team Asmus in here, dad and son with Pursuit of Power. This horse was favored last time, did not get the job done. This might be a deeper field overall. Will Walden runner, Maggie was talking about summon your courage. Yeah, moves from the synthetic last time at Turfway Park. Imperial Shadow 0 for 10. This horse is a big price for a reason, stepping back up in class. Pace with crossing. Yeah, was involved in that pace last time. It wasn't a horrible race considering. There's some talent there, but Mount Craig now 0 for 12. He's had his chances. He's hit the board in several, but I don't even know if he's on the way to one of his better races. Eddie Lee, first time starter for Lindsey Schultz. Yeah, Lindsey Schultz only has one first time start, starter winner out of 18 attempts. 
PR, call me maybe, John Court. Yeah, it was 72 to one last time, didn't do much running. Looks okay on the track. Uh, Quality West, the first time starter for Brad Cox. They paid a decent amount, $500,000 for this horse as a yearling. Little bit of pedigree, taking no money right now. Six to five favor for Kenny McPeak, Ben Franklin. Six to five favorite that doesn't always break that well. Keep your eye on the 10. And the brother to the great flight line. Here he is, Olivier, start number two. At least they don't look anything alike, right? As this horse will try to step into his brother's hoof prints, try to at least get the first victory of his career. Francisco Arietta for Rudolph Brissett. Getting more ground here in start number two after he went six furlongs in that debut. Even money, though. That's a lot of money here on Ben Franklin, who has you know, his last couple of starts. And even, you know, the four-year-old debut, 90 buyer speed figure when he went to the bench here in the comeback race was not far off it. No, and, and look, I, 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 I get, I mean, from a speed figure standpoint, this horse makes sense. But I just, I can't take short prices on horses that have shown a habit of not breaking particularly quickly, especially on like in a dirt race, because it's just, it's not where you want to be. Now last away, last time out. Let's go to Maggie. And Polly, as we take a look at the even money favorite, Ben Franklin, are we going to be counting the Benjis later? Uh, he, he's the barometer and he's the one to beat. JK's right. He stumbled really bad. It doesn't say it in the common lines, but he got off to a bad start last time and he closed into us really slow pace. And, you know, I know there's a lot of second place finishes in here, but when you look at those races and the number that he's run, somebody's going to have to step up and beat him. And I understand it could be seconditis, but I'm, I'm kind of just... The 11, Flightline's brother, I think, is getting played because of it. And I just, uh, I don't see the 11 making that big of a jump to go by the 10. What does Richie say? Mrs. Mrs. Mays had oh, eight children. Only one of them was Willie. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, look, Ben Franklin, too, he gets back to a fast track, second off the layoff. And... He's just run faster, and he's, I, I get it, maybe does he really want to win? I don't know. I don't know if you can make that, you know, you know, that ruling on him with only four starts under his belt. No, and he, actually, right before the race, talked to assistant trainer Ray Briner, and he said to me, he said, listen, this horse is nice. He just needs a couple breaks. Last time, he, he went to his knees out of the gate. A couple other times, he's had some trouble, but he says he's caused his own trouble. He just needs to behave a little bit, and he's run into a field where I think he does lay over. Someone's going to have to jump up in here. Like the 11, maybe he does, and I know you like the two a little bit as well. And that's the thing, is that like the two, many of these are over horses, over a lot yeah. uh, horses. But summon your courage. I know he tried the synthetic coming in, first start for Will Walden off of the long layoff. There are dirt figures in there as a two-year-old. Mind you, this horse was running 80. Uh, he had 180 yeah. as a two-year-old. And I don't love the fact that Todd Pletcher was seemingly reluctant to stretch him out. But I think this two-turn mile will suit him really nicely he looked great in the prelims yeah you're right he's only he only ran twice as a three-year-old and then he had his four-year-old debut and he ran a lot as a two-year-old he, mm -hmm. he he was the closest i remember the race he had at churchill downs when he had the lead and he got one of the worst peats and and he he's the closest one in here to breaking his maiden at least on the page the two besides obviously the 10 in here but you know horse does possess a little bit of a you know uh, speed um, and got that inside slot and that's yeah. you know key saving you know ground in these type of races is big that's where somewhere like the 10 and the 11 you know the outside spots have not been gravy here especially going long yeah that's true breaking right in the middle of the field one of our old friends Mount Craig uh, I remember him and Heroes Medal duking it out up at Saratoga this past summer, and they were, like, laying all over yeah. each other. Here's Metal. He's broken his maiden now. Yeah. So what's up, Mount Craig? i tell you what. Mount, I asked Ryan Wilkett, who was sitting behind us earlier, I said, who's bigger, Mount Craig or Just Steel? He said, I don't know. That's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar against Victor Wembanyama. They're pretty close. I mean, Mount Craig has got, he is giant. He is a giant animal. I'll tell you what, he is gorgeous yeah. to look at. I think all the ladies on the backside like Mount Craig. <laughs> and it, this is one of the better times I've seen him look, too. So coming off the bench, we'll see what Mount Craig can do as we get it back to Greg. 
There he is. Yeah, 12 to 1. I, I remember his first start, and it looked like it was a pretty good field. St. Tappet was in there. He got this big figure, and then he just he gets out of the gate slow. He doesn't seem to want to finish races, and now he's over 12. And he took money a couple of times after that because I think people were kind of hoping that he would really return to that debut race. He ran a really good 83 buyer when finishing second at a mile and a quarter at Churchill Downs. And uh, he kind of peaked there and has then been in the 70s. And even his last race, a 66 going the seven and a half furlongs, maybe that's a little bit too short for him. But the chances have really racked up. And you know who's a little bit interesting to me, Jonathan, uh, at 9-2 to two right now is Summon Your Courage because he was supposed to be a good thing. When you look at who he's faced in the past, you kind of think that maybe you're getting a little bit more value on him than you have in many of his other races. Right, and, you know, last time he ran on the synthetic, so maybe they just didn't appreciate that. Maybe it has nothing to do with the trainer change, and maybe this horse will kind of pop back up and run better uh, when getting back to the dirt. That's some big names in those running lines. Kentucky Derby winner as well. Four to one. Second start back off a long layoff for Summon Your Courage. But public loves this McPeak horse. Wow. Ben Franklin, six to five favorite on a horse who habitually is slow out of the gate. And that's kind of what cost him last time. It was such a difference of trips between him and his stable mate, who was a bigger price, who was coming in off a little bit of a layoff as well because he didn't get out of the gate. He had more of an inside post position. And Southern Sunset was really up and on the pace from the start of that race. Got away cleanly and just always sort of had that tactical advantage on the more fancied McPeak runner, Ben Franklin. So you kind of want to see a horse, especially at this price, not have those same types of little quirks, little gate issues, especially when they've had a couple of starts under their belt. Five to one now, price f continuing to float up on the brother to flight line. At what, at what price for you, JK, does he become a little interesting? Uh, um, I mean, honestly, it, it not really at any price. It, it's, it, like I said, when you have a horse like this, with this type of pedigree, uh, who shows up in a six beaten fifth and is two to one on debut. You know, it's not an exact science, right? If it was an exact science, breeding would be a lot easier of a, of a ball game. I just don't think that this horse likely breathes the same air as his brother did. He didn't get the same shuffle of genetics. <laughs> There's only a couple in the history of the sport who actually have, probably. So, <laughs> my brother's a great musician, and I can't, uh, I can't even hold a note. So, <laughs> eighth from Oklahoma, Matt Dinnerman, the call. Summon Your Courage, pretty stirred up in there. The rider hopped off Christian Torres. Summon Your Courage, very rambunctious in the gate here, hopping around in there as they have loaded Ben Franklin. Looks like they're going to back out Summon Your Courage. Going to take a look at him. Track veterinarian heading over to take a look at Summon Your Courage. At this point, he's still in the gate, and looks like they're going to keep him in there now. They just adjusted him in there a little bit, and Christian's going to hop back aboard. Olivier to the outside. We're ready to go. And uh, we're off. Uneventful break. PR call me maybe out for the lead. Quality West on a hold early. He's got some natural route speed in the career debut. Pretty keyed up here, but he's on a hold as they approach the turn. Inside runners moving to pass them. Pursuit of power inside. Rides the rail to the turn and to the lead here. Mount Craig on the outside pressing a half length back. Crossing on the heels of that leader. A little bit keen. Is he going to find a way through? Doesn't look like it. He's going to have to tap off of heels and drop back to be a joint third with Olivier, who takes that third position away from crossing. Summon your courage is back in the fifth position. Quality West settles in six now. The first six separated by three lengths down the backside. They're four clear of Ben Franklin. PR call me maybe on his tail. And the two at the back, Imperial Shadow and Eddie Lee, two long shots. Down the back stretch, and it's a pretty contentious tempo here on the lead. Pursuit of power has been swarmed by both Mount Craig and Olivier, the gray horse, who's three wide with a half mile to go. Crossing right behind them. Quality West out of harm's way. Summon your courage between horses. Has to ease 
squeeze off a pair when it tight under some pressure. Now summon your courage. Four or five behind. Shake it up. The others have got to get going. Ben Franklin trying to roll on the outside but needs to do more. Around the far turn. Mount Craig, Olivier, and here's Quality West in the three path moving up. Four outside. It's Ben Franklin ready to roll. Ben Franklin on the grandstand side is going to loop the field here to the front. Mount Craig moving with them. These two together. This race ends at the 16th pole and Ben Franklin puts away Mount Craig and it's Ben Franklin. The founding fathers would be proud of this performance here by City of Light. Ben Franklin by two. Mount Craig was second. Third home in the race was crossing and then pursuit of power. Fourth across the line. Well, the favorite delivers here. Ben Franklin, Paul, is just another excellent ride by Brian Ryan, Fernandez. Yeah. And we were talking about the gate. He, he, he broke much better yeah. today. And Mount Craig ran his eyeballs out. He ran back to some of that form, but they got the setup. He was sitting like in sixth or seventh by himself all alone with a lot of horses ding dong and i thought mount craig ran giant here to hold on for a second but you know this horse is just waiting for a field to run into and he found the right field today yeah, exactly. He backed up the form he had in here and, and ran to his backing at seven to five. Good old Mount Craig. You can pretty much always count on him for finishing out your exotics at least. As you he know, like, like Greg said, like he's had some huge races and sometimes yes. he can run giant. And today he brought his running shoes on today because, like, you know, the 10 got a good setup on the front end here. I mean, they went 112, not blazing fast, but at least it was contested. And Mount Craig at least held, you know, you know, stayed around for a second, but no doubt about the 10. The horse looked like the horse to beat in the race, and Brian Hernandez, like you said, usually delivers. He does. Riding here this weekend, presumably going back to the fairgrounds as well here, but it looks as though uh, he has been on some nice horses, including Mystic Dan uh, winning the Southwest a couple weeks ago. But it was all about Ben Franklin, Kenny McPeak, and his team counting the Benjis today. Greg? We talk about him a lot, the, you know, the, the few times when we get to see him on our program. I don't think there's a better rider in the country who has talked about less than Brian Hernandez Jr. Really flying under the radar, but, you know, a lot of the rides that he's delivered on the bigger stage and some of those stakes races like Maggie touched on back in the Southwest, even with Band of Gold as well, he's so attuned to where you want to be on the racetrack. And I think that was a big difference maker for those two stakes races on the 3rd of February and got a nice ride with Ben Franklin here to go swallow up those horses that were forwardly placed. Kenny McPeak's go-to rider with good reason. He always has horses in the right spot and the favorite delivery Delivers here in the eighth. Ben Franklin, the win, breaks his maiden career start number five at seven to five. Prices when we come back, we'll move on to the ninth. An allowance optional claiming two turn mile coming up. Go either way. Make pee? Okay.
Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in here to America's Day at the Races, brought to you in part by Naira Betts. Bet any track, anywhere, anytime. The well-backed Ben Franklin graduates here, second off the layoff as a four-year-old. Please be joined by his trainer, Kenny McPeak. And Kenny, sometimes he had a little bit of trouble getting out of the gate, left himself too much to do. Brian Hernandez, though, guided him and broke well and guided him to a perfect victory. Yeah, typical Brian. He's got great timing. I mean, that's why I use him so much. So we don't want anybody to know that. Though. We want to keep that a secret. I think it's out now. Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> Tip of the hat to Chris Bakari. Thanks for the opportunity, Chris. You know, he raised this horse and beautiful horse. He, he really is. Um, Kenny, we saw you run second and third in the Rebel yesterday with, uh, I thought, two horses got a little overlooked in the wagering at big prices. Mm -hmm. But talk a little bit about both of them. Where are you heading with them? Well, they both came out of the races really well. Um, you know, I think Northern Flame might be a little bit distance limited. Um, you know, we're going to probably powwow about that. I was talking to Justin Cassie this morning about, you know, next steps. He's racing manager for Mr. Oxley. And then Harold Lerner, who owns the other half with his partners. But, um, you know, maybe we'll come back in the Hot Springs at a mile. I'm not sure. And I think the Lexington's a race that we've got on our radar. And then ultimately maybe, you know, as a – one turn mile horse i think he's going to be really good but i'm not sure he wants to go mile and eighth or even a mile and a quarter so we'll we'll uh take it as it goes to the pat day mile at churchill's another good spot so thinking about some spots there and then um common defense is going to either go louisiana derby or the spiral at turfway um we've already got mystic dan here for the arkansas derby so we've got a lot of a lot of good problems um, trying to keep them separated but look lovely horses and um, fingers crossed everything goes the right way you had embarrassment of riches when it comes to your three-year-old this uh, year but let's talk about uh, the one in the last that would be a four-year-old in 10 days later uh, what can you tell us about this horse uh, you know i thought he got a again a great ride by brian hernandez last time out but was wired is he a horse that you just got to let him make one run well, he's a bit pace. Uh, yeah, you got to ha you got to have a little pace in front of him to run at. Um, you know, as a two-year-old and a three-year-old, I thought he was going to stick his nose in the middle of some of the Triple Crown races. He had a little issue, a little distal bone bruising, which is an easy fix with time. But um, you know, today's kind of a direction changer with us. If he runs well, great, and if he doesn't, we might find an easier spot, and I might even turn him out and geld him. So, you know, I um, actually haven't talked to Scott King about that yet, but, but hey, Dropping Scott, bombs. we're out there. <laughs> but anyway, but um, he's a nice little horse. Um, I actually know the family really well. I trained the second dam and cool. the mayor. I knew the mayor really well. So anyway, but he's been a lot of fun considering he wasn't very expensive, but he does, he does need to step up today. All right. Well, looking forward to seeing him later. Congratulations, no, though. No. Nice victory here with Ben Franklin. Got really good staff, great clients, good horses. That's all you need in this game. Recipe for success, guys. Well, he's got a couple in that race to, to close things out. And the man who just won this race for him, Brian Hernandez Jr., is going to be on the bigger price in there, or at least morning line. Although it doesn't mean a lot at Oakland Interlock Empire. This win, impressive as this source now can look on to bigger and better things. And I'm sure that they've really just kind of wanted to get this over with. They know this horse has ability. They've really been knocking on the door of a big victory of his own. He's been running fast races and now puts all the pieces together today. It yeah, clearly had some issues. Didn't get started until September is a three-year-old year. When you have a talented horse like this, you'd like to get him going a little bit earlier. Now they've got him going in the right direction. The son of City of Light feels like uh, could make some noise if they keep, continue to improve. Ninth race, next uh, allowance optional claiming two-turn mile and Ain't Life Grant scratched out of the Razorback to run in this spot. It's going to be his first start back since early July for Kelly Von Hemel. Manny Esquivel will be in the irons in a horse who's shown a lot of ability. Eight for 14 in his career. Right now the five to two favorite. We're going to take a timeout. When we come back, Pride's made most of his biggest moments in his career to this point. No more for Senor Buscador. What a win for Todd Fincher and company. We'll take a look back next.
Good Magic is off to a meteoric start at stud, having sired two Eclipse Award finalists in first crop Kentucky Derby champion Mage and second crop grade one winning two-year-old Muth. With just two crops to race, Good Magic ranked 21st on the general sire list with nearly 10 million in progeny earnings. Mage's graded stakes winning full brother Doorknock is one of the leading contenders for this year's Kentucky Derby. Good Magic, the classic sire. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race. from every track, every track, on every screen, every, screen. every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. with you on America's Day of the Races on our FS2 coverage. Saudi Cup from Saturday, you know, a year ago this time, Senor Buscador had another big win in the desert. New Mexico, he won for $75,000. Uh, this a little different stage, 20 million on the line against one of the deepest group ones we may see assembled all year long and gets the win of his life. He's such a cool horse. I mean, he really hasn't ducked anyone throughout his career. He's danced all the big dances, and he's always kind of come up a little bit short, even though he is that model of consistency. And this is the stage to finally get that big first grade one victory. And I had said online that it would be pretty cool if today was the day for Senor Buscador. Well, Junior Alvarado said it was pretty cool. What a moment for Todd Fincher, JK, and, and this group to get a win like this again too this field not just the group one this field was loaded with talent no absolutely you, you said it i mean this is an outstanding grade one race right you got the breeders cup classic winner you've got uh in, in national treasure you had the uh the pegasus winner excuse me the other way around national treasure pegasus, the pegasus winner and you had white abario the breeders cup classic winner it was a heck of a race and senior buscador did it in a very impressive way look we all know the Kentucky Derby is one of the biggest races you can win, the Breeders' Cup Classic. This was a $20 million race. That is a lot of money. It's only one of them. They get 10 mil, these connections. <laughs> what a performance from this horse. It seems like you know gets that one turn a mile and an eighth and suits this horse perfectly. It really seemed to help set up his closing kick. You know, he's a horse that he has to have that pace to close into. And really that track configuration where those horses have to go a little bit quicker early on helped him quite a bit. And a horse in Saudi Crown, who was one of those horses up close early, ran very well to finish third, I thought. Longer stretch, too, than any racetrack there is in North America. So he got to really have that kick. Uh, make it count there in that race. What a performance. Meanwhile, earlier on, not traditionally JK race where we see horses come out of and have success in the Derby, um, but there's a lot of hype about Forever Young, and he lived up to it. B barely. Yeah, even he did. It was close, though, right? I mean, Bookham Dano, uh, the, the, the U.S. contingent, was, uh, was almost home. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people were talking about Forever Young being uh, the real deal. We'll, we'll see what uh, what comes of that. But, you know, it's it's a it's a big race. It's on dirt. It makes sense as a as a race that you can look to for what could potentially come in terms of the Kentucky Derby. 
And he's a horse that's really undefeated now as well. I know they're thinking about going the UAE Derby route to get to the Kentucky Derby, and it hasn't really been successful in the past, but I don't think they've ever really attempted it with a horse quite like this. Meanwhile, Book of Daniel looks like uh, they're going to get to be a little more realistic with this horse. Pat Day Mile, potentially for him, they're going to cut back. Or not cut back, but not move on to the longer distances. He ran really well in defeat in that race. I think that he has a, a world of talent and really looking forward to what he can do in the future. Fun Saturday. We're going to look at more stakes action from Hot Springs when we return. Zeitlos in the carousel. Been incredibly consistent. Coming up with a big win. More on that when we return on our Sunday FS2 coverage. Back in our FS2 coverage, America's Day at the Races. Good to have you with us. Brought to you in part by Hillendale at Alapa. Getting set for the final two late double coming up at Oaklawn. Take a look at the Saturday stakes winners from that tremendous card on the road to the Oaks and the Derby. But the stakes action began, Paulie, in a carousel. Steve Asmussen, eighth victory in this race and it looks like Zeitlos is a filly on quite a roll right now. Yeah, and I think she's a filly that's on the rise. You're right uh, there, Greg. And I thought she was very impressive yesterday. I, I think it might have been her best win because she didn't really have everything her own way. Even Tyler Gaffleone told Maggie after the race that, you know, kind of was a weird trip. I was kind of in between horses. And then when I, you know, tipped her out, she just had plenty for me on cue you know and this is a filly that if you look at her first career start she dropped the jockey in her second career start she bobbled very badly and talking to steve he basically said listen she was so green as a two-year-old i had to take her to the sidelines and ever since they, when they brought her back as a three-year-old in april she's not missed the board She's now got four wins, four seconds, and she's getting better and better, Greg. And you wonder, you know, I always try to ask Steve these type of questions, but he never really, he keeps everything close to the vest. You know, in this second career start, this Philly by Curlin, he went long with his horse going a, a mile, but most of the time when Steve takes the approach, if it's not broke, you know, if it's, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it, you know, wherever you want to say it. So this horse is doing well sprinting. He will keep this horse sprinting, even though I think that she might want to be able to go around two turns, but the way she's running right now, I don't think he's going to change anything. A Curlin, yeah, who's winding up 
a, a sprinter for Steve Asmussen. Interesting. He knows where to spot his horses. I mean, he isn't the winningest trainer in North America because he keeps up with what horses don't want to do, right? So he's really found out what she excels at and has kept her at that level and it's paid off for him. The other thing I think is when you have the, the skins on the wall that Steve Asmussen does, and there's a lot of trainers like that, I think you can kind of, you don't get sucked into the traps of your owners being like, oh, let's try this big race spot around two turns. Steve can say, no, 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 we have a sprinter and we're going to stay sprinting. And I, I think having the uh, that, that Hall of Fame, having being the winningest trainer in North America can, can allow you to kind of keep horses in spots they need to be in. Post parade here coming up for the ninth two-turn mile. And again, the favorite outside, the eight ain't life grand. And you can see why Connection said, let's back away from, from the Razorback and that kind of competition and get an easier spot back first off the bench. Let's go to Maggie for more. Uh, please be joined by trainer Kelly Von Hemel. And Kelly, coming back here with Ain't Life Grand, I, I know in an article you said he had bone bruising, gave him the, the optimal time, didn't run in the Razorback, opted to run here, a little bit more of an easier spot to get his campaign back going. Exactly. Uh, uh, coming into there, we just really entered in the Razorback in case this race didn't go. And uh, hopefully we can get a good race in us today, but uh, we're excited to get him back in the in the starting gate. What a talented Iowa bred uh, and campaigned um, to buy his breeders. Talk a little bit about what he, he kind of means to your stable. I mean, eight for 14 life. He's just a model of consistency. Yeah, he just tries every time. And, and uh, we haven't had a good horse for a while. And when he came along, uh, not that by not this time, who I trained Miss Macy Sue. Yeah, so cool. it's, it's been really, really exciting. And for Ray and Peggy, they're great customers and better friends. So to have one for them, it's been special. Well, wishing you the best of luck with him. He looks spectacular so far in the prelims. Thank you. All right. Eight Life Grand trying to get back on track today and certainly looking as though he's ready to do so, Greg. All right. We'll see how he fares in the return. We start with Injunction here in our post parade. You know, I like this horse quite a bit. He's run into some big names throughout his career as he comes back off a layoff. Great escape next door with Christian Torres. Yeah, it comes in off of a break and has won once off of a break, but not too many times. Presidential with Ramon Vasquez. We'll see if he can kind of step up and face some of the horses that if they run their better races, they're going to beat him. Silver prospector, Keith Dasmussen for dad. Yeah, get to Lasix again. I, I thought this was the only horse that could beat the favorite. Pat's property has a couple of good performances coming in. Yeah, he has some numbers that would make him a competitor, especially that race two back behind Frosted Grace. Brigadier General, two back. We're in a huge effort at Keeneland. 100% has to find that race two back. Unfortunately, it took place on a sloppy racetrack and in Lexington. <laughs> Logical myth, 2101. He's a horse that has run on both surfaces throughout his career. He might be a little bit of a better turf horse. And here he is. We just heard from his trainer, Ain't Life Grant, with Manny Esquivel. Uh, look, I, I liked this horse. This was my pick in the Razorback. So I don't have a choice but to like him in this spot. Still, it's not the, uh, opting for an easier spot, but there's a couple of tough customers he's going to have to deal with in this one. But let's take a look at him. Back in action. This was May 5th of last year. Three starts before he went to the bench. It was a stakes win. He's been a, a solid horse throughout his career, right? Eight wins, 14 lifetime stars. You can see that he's running down the center of the racetrack here at Oakland. You know that he likes this surface, is able to get the job done right here. He was a big price this day. He was 10 to 1 when winning this race because he's had most of his success over at Prairie Meadows. But I like that he's already proven that he can compete on a stage like this against open company and a horse that really one of the only bad races was against Epicenter in the Travers, Jonathan. Yeah, look, the big question is the break, right? Um, but and I, I, that was the question yesterday as well, if this horse would have ran in the Razorback. But I think that the, 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 the competition is a little bit lighter here, so I'm a little less concerned. Does have to be, you know, just have to show up and run his big race here. You know, I would have, I would have to think that a 90, 95% type race out of Ain't Life Grand. But I, I, I do feel like you can get that. And I love the draw towards the outside with the horse that I feel like is the best. And, you know, you do see a couple of other times he came back off the bench. Not his best performances. I don't know what that means for today. But two to one favor right now as we send it back to Maggie and Paul. 
And Paul, as we get back to Ain't Life Grand here on this end, um, he does pick up Manny Esquivel. Would be remiss not to say that. But what I saw too in this race, it feels like there are several horses who are going to provide some pace for him to run at. Yeah, I mean, he, listen, he's an honest horse, eight for 14 life. And there's nothing you can really knock. And he's done a great job with him, um, has Kelly in. Yeah, I can understand where, you know, Greg's going. He, he hasn't ran well sometimes when he's coming off the layoff. You do see Epicenter in his, his, his running line. So he's running against some tough company. But like I said, when you win eight out of 14 races, we saw it yesterday with Octane, they're tough customers. I thought it was interesting if, if people didn't realize the reference that uh, Kelly Von Hemel was talking about. Not this time, his dam yeah. is Ms. Macy Sue, who he trained. Yeah. So it was really cool that he's, you know, basically trained this whole family. Yeah, right? um, but I, I'm excited to see this horse back. He has gotten a little bit hot out on track. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily out of character, but something I do pay attention to when you're dealing with the horse coming off the layoff. Let's talk about number one injunction in here for Carlo Vacaresa. Uh, I thought ran a really good race last time, albeit back in November at Churchill behind the favorite best actor. He's, he's, he's run against the best horses in here by far. If you go back and go back to the races in the Clark, back past the turf races, he got beat by Proxy, who was fourth in the Breeders' Cup Classic, Senior Buscador, who we just saw win yesterday. He was behind Three Technique, who's a one-turn monster now. So, like, Injunction's run against some really good horses yeah. for Carlo Vaccareza, and this horse is shipping in, I think, with a purpose. I think he looks spectacular, too. I think he is definitely the best alternative to your favorite Ain't Life Grand, uh, both of which, though, to have to come off respective layoffs, public seeing it that way kind of as well at 3-1. to one. But then you have the horse that does have the recency, and that's Silver Prospector. Look, he has literally danced every dance throughout his, what, five-year career yeah. now as a seven-year-old, uh, banked over $1.4 I, I, I just feel as though he's one of those horses that really, truly lacks that killer instinct, and he needs everything to fall into his lap. I'm kind of with you. I mean, yeah. he's the other horse in here, and can he catch the one and eight sleeping off the layoff? Maybe they're not going to be as ready, and the four does have those couple races. But you're right. He's the kind of horse that doesn't have that finishing punch. He's always right there around the wire, but I think he'll get a good spot. We'll just see if he's good enough, and we'll see if the one or eight are, are ready in here, and if anybody else. I think five pats property is going to lay out the fractions in yeah. here, um, definitely for uh, John Horan, who's got a lot of big upsets here at this meet. So I think the five, he's a tough customer too, but I think he's the one that cuts out the fractions, and we'll see where the one and the eight li lie in here. Maybe the eight can get position early. Yeah, I wish, I kind of wish Pat's property wasn't in here because I really like the looks of Brigadier General, right. and I think he is a more or less need the lead type and doesn't want any kind of pressure. So I was like, oh, I guess I got to forget Brigadier General today. <laughs> See, ships in for Dallas Stewart. But the main three certainly looking the part out on the track, Greg, is Ain't Life Grand. Wasn't he your Travers pick a couple years ago? Am I right about that? Wow, you might, yeah, you may be right. I think he was. <laughs> he did not run all that well that day. Uh, 26 to 1 in that epicenter race when he was seventh, beat 12 lengths to be one horse. Well, he went for a price, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, Dang, <laughs> Maggie trying to bring up old stuff. <laughs> Rubbing salt in the wounds. <laughs> Can't fault you for picking a long shot like that. Come on, Maggie. I don't think she's taking a shot. <laughs> Just reminding me. <laughs> I like this guy. Uh, we'll see how he fares today off the bat. Hey, there's a question mark here coming back off the layoff, how he's going to fare. And, you know, even though he does get this somewhat easier spot, as we've said, Silver Prospector, a lot of big races, face top company as well. Serious horse he's got to deal with here. I mean, this horse is, is just really cool. I mean, throughout his career, he's banked almost 1.5 million, and he's not exactly a horse that finds himself in the winner's circle as much as you would expect for how successful he's really been. He's danced a lot of dances. He's run into a lot of quality horses and run well. He's just kind of always that bridesmaid type, a little bit under the radar in terms of who he's faced throughout his career. But look, he, he has run well and kept his good form. And it's not as though those super fast races are that far behind him, Jonathan. Yeah, and he comes in off of 10, Ain't Life Grain I'm talking about, comes in off of 10 works. Um, there is a little bit of a break 
and sometimes they just get missed on the on the tab between January and 11th and January 30th, which I guess could be a little bit of a concern. Maybe there was a setback there. Maybe they had to take a week off. Uh, sometimes, like I said, sometimes I do get missed. But look at all these five furlong works. I mean, he's got. I, if I look through here, I, it's almost like seven of them are five furlong works. I I just feel as if he's he's likely going to be fit enough for this situation. What about a horse like the five Pat's property? Um, he's put together two very good efforts last couple of starts when he got, you know, Silver Prospector didn't win that race, but he finished second. He was way behind him. That was the first start for him in about six months or so. So he had an excuse that day. You know, he's interesting at a big price. I think uh, Paul touched on the fact that he thinks he's a horse that's going to be in front in here. We'll see how much pressure Brigadier General applies to his outside, but I don't think that you can be completely dismissive of him because he does have the recency edge and perhaps a pace edge on some of his foes. And the favorite now, J.K., a horse who, if he can repeat what he did last time out, it was November 23rd. He hasn't raced since in Junction. It's going to be tough here. Yeah, he ran well that day. Um, he got a nice little trip inside um, save some ground all the way around there. He's got those three turf races. These in-betweener types are hard for me to trust in terms of surface. Matt Dinnerman, the call, ain't life grand. He'll be the last in, the eight horse to the outside. First start back since July 8th. Here it is. Next winner. Ain't life grand making his 2024 debut. We're ready to go. And uh, Laroff, Pat's property, ducked inwards just a little bit at the start, but he's recovered, broke very sharply indeed, and he's on the lead here. Great escape to the inside, takes a hold, will track Pat's property, who's quickest into the clubhouse turn. And second is Great Escape down on the inside of Brigadier General. Logical miss, it's three wide. Then another three lineup, Silver Prospector, Presidential, Injunction, easing off that pair now is second to last. Eight Life Grant at the back with Injunction, who shuffled to the rear. Seven likes from tip to tail as they approach the backstretch run. It's Pat's property in front by a length. Logical Myth right behind him in second. Then Brigadier General, great escape. They're side by side. Silver Prospector is three wide with that party. Presidential, four off the leaders. Two clear of Ain't Life Grand passing Injunction, who's under a little pressure now. Injunction drops to the back and needs to turn it around as they're halfway home in the penultimate race on the card. Pat's property looking to give Rocco Bowen a hat trick here, and he's a big price too. Pat's property a half length in front. Silver Prospector three wide and that forces the hand of Logical Myth who moves up between horses. Logical Myth, Silver Prospector right together. Pat's property sent along inside of them fighting hard. A gap of two to Great Escape. Brigadier General's done. Presidential moving inside of him. Ain't Life Grand's got to get going. Five behind gets to the outside as Silver Prospector, the old pro, hits the lead in the middle of the track and kicks down the lane to a two-length edge. Great Escape second. This race ending at the 16th pole. It's Silver Prospector, Great Escape second, and then Logical Myth, Silver Prospector coming to the line. Silver Prospector wins it. Great Escape was second, Logical Myth third, Ain't Life Grand rallies on for fourth and gallops out well. Silver Prospector, your winner. The horse with the recency, Polly, the one that was more forwardly placed, gets the job done. Silver Prospector, well, he didn't have to run in a stake today, and I think that, you know, made him feel pretty confident. Yeah, and you can see, I was telling you, I'm like, Keith is going to have to wait to the last second. And it's just like the, the two favorites just didn't fire in here. They needed a race off the layoff. Great escape, ran on nicely here, and Keith keeps on winning races. And by the way, my... Form. It's windy down here. My form has been flying around. <laughs> Maggie, did you play soccer when you were younger? That was one of your best <laughs> Ronaldos right there. You saved my form from going using those quick feet down there. But yeah, four to one on Silver Prospector in here. And a little nice little trifecta with the seven to 23 to one checking in third. Yeah, that's true. Now, Eight Life Grand, he had to settle for fourth, kind of well back in here, Paulie. Made a bit of a run. I think he'll benefit from the race. Yeah. The real disappointment was the horse that they actually sent off as favorite in number one injunction. He showed nothing. I thought he'd be more forwardly placed. He got yeah. sort of, you know, behind the eight ball a little bit. I'm with exactly. you on Eight Life Grand. I thought he 
ran a useful race. This right. is something that he wanted. He came closing a little bit. The four had recency on him, but I like the way he finished up the race. I think he's going to be just fine for his next start. Silver prospector. I mean, this is just the tip of the hat to Hall of Famer Steve Asmussen for just keeping a horse like this going as he has. And, and at the, some of the highest levels, as he uh, pushes his earnings, you would have to think upwards of nearly $1.5 now. And Keith riding for his dad gets the win with Silver Prospector. I know uh, a barn favorite as well. Yeah, it, it really is. And you're right. Steve is not afraid to claim nine-year-olds. He Payne just ran an unbelievable back-to-back -back race. He's nine, and he's in unbelievable condition. You're right. He keeps these horses at seven, eight, and nine, Just and he lets them just do light work in the morning and the big work in the afternoon. Yeah, Silver Prospector relishing it today for Ed and Susie Orr. Guys, he went off four to one, so nice little return on a convincing winner. And yeah, that's a generous price on a horse as a graded stakes winner and was coming in in incredibly sharp form for the winningest part in North American history. Yeah, a little father-son duo here gets the job done. Keith Asmussen had ridden him in his last two starts as well, so probably got to know this horse a little bit more in the afternoon and really able to get him to the winner's circle today when really those two shorter price favorites coming off the layoff, they just didn't fire quite as the betting public expected. It's just becoming a regular occurrence now. Keith Asmussen for dad, but especially Keith in the winter circle. I mean, he's one of the top riders of the meet in terms of wins. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, Keith was a, was a student at the University of Texas, and COVID came around, and he decided, you know, I, I want to, you know, he'd been around horses. He'd ridden horses on the farm. He said, I, I want to try to ride in a race one time. And uh, it's turned into a, a, a great at stakes win and, a, and an outstanding meet at one of the biggest meets in the country. We got the 10th still to come. Father-son combo, Steve and Keith, Asmussen teaming up with Silver Prospector in the ninth. General admission tickets are on sale now for the Belmont Stakes Racing Festival at Saratoga, June 6th through 9th. Admission is just $10 on Thursday as well as on Sunday for this historic event. Visit belmontstakes.com slash tickets today. Racelands is the most in-depth product in horse racing with unique features found nowhere else. True odds, predictive analysis, and pace projection. Racelands, it will change the way you follow horse racing and take your game to the next level. Cyberknife was a very talented horse from day one. A very gifted, fast horse, a lot of speed, able to carry it around two turns. Looks a tremendous amount like Gunrunner, same ability and talent, beautiful physical, outwork every horse on the board. Holds the track record in the Haskell. He won it in impressive fashion, beating a very good group of horses. And Cyber Knight has won the TVG.com Haskell over Tava. Jack Christopher finished third. The Arkansas Derby was one of his best. It showed how much talent he really does have and stamped himself as one of the best three olds in the country. Cyber Knight ranks up there as one of the most talented horses I've ever had in training. Multiple grade one winner, brought it every time you let him over there. Excited about him passing on his durability, his soundness, and his talent. And if he does, he could definitely be a breed shaping stallion. Welcome back to the program. It's America's Day at the races. As we saw, the father-son duo teaming up to win today's feature race. The old veteran silver prospector gets the win. Well-timed ride here by Keith Asmussen. First of all, though, I got to ask you, has it sunk in that you won your first graded stakes yesterday with a lemon muffin? <laughs> I'm afraid it has. I got, I, got, I got a good 20 minutes of sleep last night. So. Oh. <laughs> the excitement, I, I, I can only imagine. But talk a little bit about Silver Prospector. Kind of a barn favorite. He's been around forever. I saw when he, you came back to the winner's circle, you gave him a big hug. <laughs> Absolutely. Barn favorite, for sure. A war horse that's been around the barn for a long time. And I've had the pleasure of being able to be around him for kind of the duration of 
the time we've had him. Working him in the morning, assumably, but it was only until two starts or three starts ago that Dad put you on. Were you excited to get on him? Absolutely. You know, just uh, being able to watch the horse and, you know, trying to have formulate an opinion of how he likes to be ridden and just, you know, today try to put a smile on his face, go along, get along, and wide sweep and move. He's full of heart, full of run, and... Is he a horse that you have to time things right or, or kind of like let him think he's doing it on his own kind of thing? Exactly. You know, I just want to stay out of his head, just make sure there's a smile on his face down the backside. He likes being outside of horses and just fills him with confidence and just let him do his thing. So It's really fun to get your uh, take on these horses and how you read them. Job well done here. Perfectly read on Silver Prospector today. Thank you, Maggie. All right. Keith Asperson knocking home the winners at the highest level too, Craig. See the joy on his face and what that meant when holding that, that trophy high in the winner's circle with that grade three win and the honeybee first grade at stakes win of his career. All these wins for dad, the terrific meet he's having. We've just seen him grow up you know, right before our eyes here at Oakland. It's been really incredible, the, the ascent to the success level he's experiencing right now. And I'm sure that he'll have more graded stakes victories soon to come in his in his career because he's riding at the top level right now. He talks like a guy who's been training for 25 years, Wonder but like he from. kind of has <laughs> to a certain extent. He's, you know, growing up uh, <laughs> around his dad and his brothers and his grandfather uh, and his uncles. It's it's it, he has been almost training for 25 years. Hey, who is he kidding too? Come on, going to grad school. He knew where he's going to wind up in that family, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, got to yeah, be in the horse I, racing I think he business. thought he was going to be doing the accounting for the family. He's got <laughs> his, if I'm not mistaken, he's got his MBA in accounting from the University of Texas. So he's obviously qualified to help with the books as well. We're going to take a time out. We'll be back when we return. We'll look back to the Rebel on the road to this year's Kentucky Derby. Three-year-old debut. Not bad for Timberlake. Talk about what's potentially next for him and where he stacks up in this three-year-old division next. Back with you on America's Day of the Races on our FS2 coverage. Finale coming up at Oak Lawn. Entry level allowance race, mile on the 16th. And going to break, we talked about that road to the Derby in the Rebel. Timberlake, Brad Cox was very high uh, on this horse coming back the way he'd been training in the morning. Still has a few things to, to work out, a little bit maybe tired in the stretch. And you know, coming first, first race in about four months, you can expect that, but he got the job done. 
thought this was a big step forward for him in terms of his mental maturity. A horse that maybe had that propensity to be a little bit high strung early on in the race. And I think that he didn't show that in this effort. And I think that that's a good sign going forward. Yes, I mean, this is a, a great starting point for a horse who's got a great foundation, who came in off of a poor, not a poor, a poor effort per what I think people thought he was gonna run in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Um, and he shows back up here and he, you know, I thought he did it extremely well. He got a 93 buyer for this effort. I think this likely puts him in the in the catbird seat to be the favorite for the Rebel. I mean, excuse me, for the Arkansas Derby. I, I thought he ran extremely well first time as a three-year-old. And uh, yeah, the man filling in for Florent Giroux, of course, was out of town. Brian, uh, another big race. He was very excited because that is the richest race Christian Torres has ever won. The purses at Oakland are lucrative. I mean, $1.25 million for this derby prep. You kind of see why they have such big fields as they do. A lot of horses want to get in on those funds. Big though, too. I mean, look, JK, this is the first win for him around two turns. And as you said, great starting point. It's always the, the question this time of year when you're getting these talented horses that are getting chances to go two turns for the, for the first time. Um, usually, at this point, you've, they've already passed that test. But with Timberlake having that time off, we're just finding out now. And I thought he passed that test well. We'll see uh, ultimately where he winds up next. That uh, Arkansas Derby, 100 points to the winner. That's coming up late March. Let's go back to Hot Springs. Holly, it's dark back there in New York. I know, <laughs> Just right? looking at you guys on the monitor, but Holly, it was blue skies and sunshine for the Rebel yesterday day here. And as you guys were saying, it feels like Timberlake has picked up where he left off three consecutive mm -hmm. 93 buyer speed figures. But I think I saw a little bit of maturation with this horse, at least mentally. Yeah, and, and I think there's a little bit more to go. Yep. Um, I think the thing behind it is a lot of people will look back at the race and say, okay, Timberlake laid over the race, but you know what? You only can put the horses in front of the horse and he got the job done. And Common Defense, who ran second, has been well regarded just as much as Mystic Dan. Um, and so I think it's a legit win. I think Common Defense ran a legit second. And I actually think this horse is gonna get better he kind of a little bit lost when he got to the front because I think he's still, like you said, figuring things out. When he does, he could be scary. I just like the fact that he settled because he yeah. showed it in a couple of those two-year-old races that when he got kicked back, he could get quite rank, and he settled beautifully in and amongst horses early on in this race, and you have to be able to do that yeah, when I you're heading towards a derby. Well, that's what I, I wanted to mention to you because when I went back and when I watched the replay, he stood in the gate perfectly Perfect. handed the, the prelims perfectly that's a huge part when we get to the first saturday in may and i think that that is the horse being a very intelligent horse obviously brad does a tremendous, tremendous job brad cox with his horses but he, like you said he did it so professional and you need that there, you can't have any hiccups and i think he's going to get better and better yeah and we'll see can he keep uh, answering the distance question looks like possibly arkansas derby or the bluegrass, bluegrass yeah. um as uh yeah looking forward to what is next for timberlake certainly my favorite two-year-old of last year coming back with style yesterday guys where was, where was the jt pun <laughs> we had a lot of, we used them all up yesterday, I guess. I love the fact too, this horse has some attitude and the fact that he says, don't put that damn flower blanket on me. If you're gonna put something around me, it better be roses. <laughs> yeah, he says, I, I'm waiting for the real flowers come uh, first Saturday in May. And really, Jonathan, is it is it all just a clever ploy to get Justin Timberlake to come out to the Kentucky Derby? Hey, I, I think if it, if it works, then it was a good idea. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> So he goes to the top of the list, Sierra Leone, who was impressive with Fairgrounds, second on there. Points don't mean a lot at this point. So many horses still um, can step up, run huge performances, and vault themselves at the top of that list. We have those 100-point races still to come. So even though we're getting closer and closer, a lot is going to change. Yeah, but also being at the top of the list means nothing. Yeah. You just, gonna, you just gotta be 19th or 20th. That's all that really matters. Make sure you get into the starting gate, and you can figure the rest of it out later. Or even be on that, that AE list the day before like Rich Strike was. Yeah, it worked out for him well, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we still have the nightcap coming up uh, at Oaklawn, 10th race to close things out, mile and a 16th. First allowance condition race, Kenny McPeak. You'll have Julian Leperu in the irons on 10 days later. Five to two favorite. 
right now. Speaking of Julian, first full season in Hot Springs and things are going pretty well. We'll have more on Leperu when we come back on our FS2 coverage. Stay with us. War Dancer, New York's leading turf sire again in 2023 with standouts like Barrage at Saratoga. Here's Barrage with a final surge. Barrage got him. War Saichi dominant on the dirt at Finger Lakes. War Saichi has scampered well clear. War Saichi all the way with the top spot. And Danzig Queen on the tap of the surface at Woodbine. And Danzig Queen will come away and win by a length. Consistently producing winners on dirt, turf, and synthetic. War Dancer, proud to stand in New York. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race from every track on every screen every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. French jockey Julian Leperu has had an esteemed career since moving to the U.S. nearly 20 years ago and kicking things off as a champion apprentice jockey. He followed that up by winning the Eclipse Award for Outstanding Jockey in 2009, the same year he won three Breeders' Cup races. Informed decision two for Julian Leperu. They won the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. In 2015, he won his sixth career Breeders' Cup race aboard a filly he considers the best he's ever ridden. Two-time champion and Hall of Famer, Teppin. Look at Teppin! Teppin! Oh, she was huge today! Both fillies run the late for a second, but Teppin and Julia LaPeru have dominated the Breeders' Cup mile. Teppin was always my, my favorite. She, she was so amazing. Here comes Teppin, and Teppin and Julian LaPeru have won! You know, I think the Royal Ascot win was such a, a special thing. People were surprised about it, but us. It was something um, very special, yeah. Now at age 40, Leperu is hoping to rejuvenate his career. He's hired a new agent in Jose Santos Jr. And the pair decided it best for Leperu and his family to spend the winter in Hot Springs for the first time. I got together with Jose, a uh, new agent. When we first got together, we didn't have any plans for the winter. I left it to him to decide where we're gonna go. Yeah, very excited to, to be here. Be around horses, around the fans. It's always a fun time. Being in the morning, see trainers, seeing, seeing owners. It's a whole business that uh, we love, you know, and be around here is, uh, you know, it's a, it was a dream when I was five years old, so to be able to do it as a job is, uh, it's great. Le Peru feels right at home back at Oaklawn Park, the site of one of his biggest victories. It was seven years ago, he guided reigning two-year-old champion Classic Empire to a late surging victory in the Arkansas Derby. Here comes Classic Empire trying to run down the new leader, Malagasy, the champ, Classic Empire. It is Conquest Momani, Classic Empire. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him back to the winner's circle. The winner of the 81st running of the Arkansas Derby, Classic Empire and jockey Julian Leperu. Leperu is embracing his role as the accomplished veteran in a room full of mostly younger riders. 
and says there's one thing that gives him a leg up on the competition. I think experience, you know, you, with age, you, you get experience. Look, a nice effort. Look, he's been working hard, and he's got fantastic touch on a horse. I can give you a list of graded stake horses he's won on for me going back um, years and years. So always great working with him. Riding more and more every day, you, you learn something every day in this business. After a race, when you know you've done everything perfectly, everything went great, it's uh, always a, a, a nice thing, you know? He's approaching 3,000 wins in his career. And you, you look back to that you know, Clips Award when he was champion apprentice. Actually led the nation in wins that year, over 400 victories. Pretty incredible, the career that he's put together and, and really always had the success early on. But I love that he's willing to try something new, right? Willing to go to Oakland Park for the winter. I'd say that it's working out pretty well for him as he's changed agents and he's decided where to settle in. He's gotten a lot of really solid opportunities there this winter. Jose Santos Jr., one of the uh, 50, 60 guys he represents. He, he's, uh, what he does is amazing. It's not easy to do, uh, but he does it well. Slight exaggeration, but he has quite a few guys he books mounts for. Uh, we got this finale coming up, this entry-level allowance at a mile and a 16th. We're going to start things off in the post parade here with uh, Cat Daddy in a moment. 65 career starts. He's a cool old dude. I mean, this nine-year-old has really, really put quite the career together. I just kind of wonder who he really is now, if he's able to be competitive with this group. Though he does have a big workout coming into this effort. He was very competitive against this level just two starts back. He was only a, about a length behind 10 days later, who's the five to two favor right now. Did not back that up on a muddy track. Here's 10 days later. Yeah, last race, uh, that February 3rd, where the, the inside was good. This horse was wide at the end. Of Let the race. Peru on board. Here's Magoo. He's coming off a little bit of a break. Some of his better running done at Canterbury Park in the past, though he's done okay here at Oakland. Robertino Diodoro Barn, heroic move. Yeah, another one I think is interesting. He can get the job. He's got some back numbers that definitely fit. Stephen Keith Asmussen with inexorable. He's coming in off of two wins. He's been solid down at Sam Houston. Can he come over to Oakland and get the first win? Should be forward, nip and tuck. Yeah, last race was on synthetic, but does have some figures on the dirt that make it competitive. Captivating boy at eight to one. Bill Morey does not run a lot of horses at Oakland Park, but he does have good synth to dirt numbers. Speed sprinting and stretching out. That was going to be forward. The eight city legend. Yeah, not taking much money here for 10% uh, connections for the year. Interlock Empire, hard to miss. He's off a bit of a layoff. He got his career started at Oakland, though. Son of, yeah, the former Arkansas Derby winner, Classic Empire. Next, Revolt put together two back-to-back -back huge efforts late last year. Yeah, if he can find those efforts, he, he could definitely get his picture taken here, maybe forgive that last race. And Ramsey Zimmerman rider change outside on Amazing Mark. Yeah, another one not taking a lot of money and doesn't really have the numbers to make this horse competitive against this group. Six minutes to post in this finale. So let's hone in on the McPeak runner that has Julian Leperu aboard and a horse that does his running from well off the pace. Yeah, so we talked about yesterday, it was the theme a lot with Zeitlos and, 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 a, and a handful of others, Just Steel, uh, Carbone, that it's, it seems as if on February 3rd, the day of the Southwest, that the inside is where you want it to be. So when you look at races like that, the best way to find out if a bias is real is when those horses start running back. That's the best way to test that theory. And I think what we saw yesterday, horses that were wide on February 3rd ran well yesterday. Horses that were on the inside did not run as well uh, yesterday. So for me, 10 days later, who did start off on the inside as a closer, though, think about it, at the early part of the race while this horse was on the rail, wasn't doing much running. But then late in the race, when this horse is making their real move, they were in the middle of the track, where I do think uh, was the place that you didn't want to be. I think 10 days later should run significantly better than what they did last time because of the bias. Let's go back to Hot Springs with more from Maggie and Paul. And Polly, we'll take a look at number two 10 days later. Has we, uh, JK was just talking about that bias on February 3rd. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how things play out. And for me, uh, yeah, he broke from the far outside, but for most of the way, he got to save ground. I know a Machine Gun Man able to wire that day, and well done you for having Poulter, uh, <laughs> who finished second with a win, uh, coming back. 
uh, from that race yesterday posting an 86 fire. What do you make of 10 days later? Um, I, I think, you know, he, he's definitely got a, good, uh, a shot in here. You know, when you look at his races, you know, he won in his like third or fourth career start. Then after that, he's drawn some difficult posts, at least in his last three starts where he's been favorite. When everybody's drawn kind of inside, he's kind of run his race. So I, maybe like the other McPeak runner, he does have the best numbers in here. But do you try to beat it three to one? I thought kind of talking to Kenny earlier and reading between the lines, he said to me, yeah, he's a fun little horse. I can see why he said little. He's quite little. And I'm wondering if he's one that looked to have potential but never went on because Kenny also said if he doesn't show up today, then he needs to find uh, a more easier spot. And I kind of get that. I get what Kenny's trying to tell us in that he there was ability. I don't know if there still is ability against you know this group as we'll move on to number four heroic move taking a lot of money here for robertino diodoro i i don't know about the track uh back on december 29th but he was just never able to stay save any ground last time out when we saw him then no not at all and this is a horse that ran in the iowa derby the manitoba derby at, at cinnaboya downs century mile at the canadian derby i mean Robertino Diodoro, is, this horse has got some flight miles, but this horse actually ran okay last time out, flattened out a little bit from the wide post, was wide. I actually like this horse a little bit today because he kind of is a little bit tactical. I don't think he'll be as far back as he was last time. Okay, as uh, Harry Hernandez takes over here for Robertino Diodoro, three back, they had a win together as total wild card in here, Polly. That's number seven, captivating boy with the stretch out with the first time dirt. There is some pedigree to say that he'll like the uh, surface change and actually looking at him, he looks as though he'll handle the distance. We've had three horses earlier today. We had Robertino Diodoro horse win coming in from Golden Gate. We've had another horse come in from Golden Gate win. This horse was at Golden Gate, then wired to field at Turfway. The horses from Turfway have been firing here. I would think this horse, it seems like the speed on synthetic has transferred to speed here. And, you know, Bill Morey has only started one other horse at the meet. Um, I would think Captivated Boy, I'm surprised he's kind of handing out now at nine to one because he could be the speed of the speed. And Bill Morey is dangerous yeah, wherever yeah. he ships into, as we'll also take a look at the other Robertino Diodoro horse in Next Revolt. I don't like the raw effort he's coming in off of, but maybe he didn't like the track. Maybe he needed the race off a little bit of a layoff. Can he get back to some of his better efforts today? Yeah, it's a tough read because his best races is when he won at 40 cents on the dollar and 30 cents on the dollar. And I don't like to take that away from horses, but you're supposed to win those races. But he has some numbers to go to. The Remington Park numbers have been a little bit spotty. Yeah, so it's really tough to gauge. I do think this horse has got a shot, but it's very interesting to me that the four, the other Diodoro runners taking a lot more money than the 10. Very true. As guys, I think an interesting one here that we see assembled two to one, uh, holding strong with heroic move. And we'll see which Diodoro proves to be the best here in this nightcap. And which McPeak, I guess, because 10 days later, the two with Julian Lafru at two to one, but usually his go to guy is Brian Hernandez Jr., and he's on the nine interlock empire at eight to one. Sometimes it's the other one for a trainer, right? That gives you a little bit more value that ends up being that sneaky horse that you want to throw in the mix somewhere. I like the seven a little bit, a horse that Maggie and Paul touched on. Bill Morey not really running a ton of horses throughout his career at Oaklawn Park, but as they said, he's a trainer that can really get a horse home at any track that he chooses to run at. And he has really nice numbers stretching horses out in distance, as well as switching them from synthetic to dirt. So I thought this horse perhaps a little bit interesting at a big price. I feel a, I feel a maybe speech coming on. No, 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 no. No, I, 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 you know, look, I think we learned a lot yesterday about that February 3rd day. So that leads me to the 2 and the 10 here. Um, I can't really separate him. I'm going to go with the 10, though. Toward, you know, I, I, because the, the 10 has some back numbers I really do like, and, and based off of that last race, I can kind of forgive a little bit. Did spend a little bit of time on the rail, but also spent a lot of time off the rail um, on February 3rd. So I'll go with the 10 here next revolt. I wouldn't be surprised if the two runs well, but, but I'm going to go with the, the, the horse. It's two and a half the price. And you know, back to that Bill Morey run of the seven, hoping he can run on dirt, hoping he can go long. A lot of question marks, but 
You'll get rewarded if, if you're right. Eight to one right now. You can hope when it's eight to one. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to hope when they're eight to five. Exactly. You, you never want to take a horse that's doing something new at a short price. But I think eight to one is a fair enough price to sort of find out if he's capable of handling these conditions today. Two to one favorite heroic move for Diodoro with Harry Hernandez. Nightcap from Hot Springs. Let's go to Matt Dinnerman. City legend, pose position number eight, Magoo coming up. And here's the gate cam right here. Interlock Empire going into the gate. Heroic move coming up. Next revolt. Two back, inexorable, and amazing mark to the outside. Mile and a 16th, so this race ends at the regular finish line. Nip and tuck, the rider hopped off him. He was a little bit stirred up in there. Live racing resumes here at Oakland on Friday. First post will be 12.30 on a 10 race card on Friday. Amazing Mark coming up to the gate. Goes it. We're ready to go in the finale. And uh, Laruff in the nightcap. Magoo, shown rain to show speed. Captivating boy quicker and captivating boys in front with Magoo. They're pretty much together. Nip and Tuck runs in third. And next revolt, they're on the outside, parked outside of him into the turn. Then the stable mate, heroic move. He's fifth on the inside, five lengths off the pace, two lengths clear of Mazing Mark. And then comes 10 days later in a midfield position. The gray interlock empire is next. Fourth last, two lengths ahead of inexorable. City legend alongside of that rival. And Cat Daddy is the early trailer. Captivating boy takes a hold of the bit and sprints clear moves at a rapid pace 23 and one fifth seconds the first quarter for captivating boy who's opened up that lead to four legs magoo happy to track that fast pace setter in the second spot heroic move racing inside of his stablemate next revolt nip and tuck with that party down the backside here another two lengths back to Basing mark 10 days later they're four lengths clear of interlock empire and exorable they're side by side city legend and cat daddy at the back as they hit the four turn captive boy three furlongs to go a two length lead heroic move getting closer going well in second 10 days later is following that move on the inside he's gathering momentum 10 days later shaking up but moving up as they hit the quarter pole captivating boy a length and a half in front heroic move now he's pushed upon to get after that leader from second 10 days later is third inexorable behind horses looking for a spot to go heroic move after captivating boy heroic move on the outside Freezing to the front, and it's Heroic Move and Harry Hernandez pulling away for a dominant win. Heroic Move by three, by four, and finishing powerfully. Fuller run and a big hand ride late. Captivating Boy was second, third home ten days later, and Exorable was fourth. Harry Hernandez with the nice ride aboard at number four. Heroic move pumped up at the wire and full as you turned to me and said, this was the ultimate they knew. Yeah, I wish we had Andy with, Andy with us. And Andy would say, yeah, they knew. Six to five this horse got hit down to and never looked like the loser. Good pick by you with the seven who cut out the fraction here, captivating boy, just second best. Yeah, and I thought uh, kind of an enterprising, I don't want to say ride, because I don't think Mandy Espel wanted to go that yeah, fast, yeah. but captivating boy kind of drug him to the lead like that, and uh, he certainly was full of himself early on, given he was coming out of sprint races. Yeah, he was. I mean, listen, it was a good experience. You can't say that the horse did not like the distance. He just went on a, a, a rager. He was going pretty fast, 147, 112 over this racetrack. He was just second best, but he was, what? About five lengths clear from the third place finisher, but the best horse won today. And man, they sent it in late on the four. The public knew what was up. Uh, it's all right, hey, uh, Harry Hernandez getting another win and, and riding quite frequently for Robertino Diodoro uh, here uh, at the meet. Son of Quality Road out of the Smart Strike Mare family tree. Boy, that's a nice pedigree on this winner here, Greg. Indeed, six to five here. 4-7-2-5 finish, favored to close things out in, in this finale. Great job by, by Maggie Acacia, I know, left today, but great job by her as well. And Paulie, um, great coverage all weekend long. Absolutely, yeah, it's, uh, 
you know, you got to get on a plane, you got to get down there. It's it's not the easiest place to get no. to because you can't fly straight into hot springs. You usually got to go somewhere else. And I don't walk. know if we learned a lot more on, on the Triple Crown of the Oaks Trail, but certainly Timberlake has, has cemented himself as one of the major players. We've been given more information, at least, about his ability coming back. And he's asserted himself as, as really being one of those horses you need to consider moving forward as we get closer and closer to the Kentucky Derby. Well, we got a, a stake on the road to the Derby, the Gotham turning back here in New York. That'll be at a mile, and Brad Cox going to have one of the horses to beat with Bergen in that race. We'll have that for you next weekend. We hope to see you then. We are back next week, Friday, 3 Eastern start time. It was Pandagate in the Gander, three-year-old debut. Pretty impressive for Christophe Clement. Now two wins and three career starts. And how about Timberlake in that Rebel on the road to the Derby? First winner around two turns. Grade one winner adds the Rebel to the resume. It looks like he is a serious Derby contender. We'll see you next week.